Mike, why should people listen to this episode of Pod Friends? Oh boy. Why is always a great question. <laughs> I would say if you want a closer look into, frankly, a wild half decade of my life, of all the, the newness that I have been afforded, as well as a dip into why all that glitters is not gold, but why all moments are not golden, be sure to check out this episode of Pod Friends. Did I do it correctly? Was I supposed to finish on a certain remark or something? I, I mean, you can just keep going forever if you want. I don't know. I mean, listen, don't challenge me. I've shown over the past two and a half hours that I'm more than likely to do so. Well, I mean, if this is at the start of the episode, then it's the next two and a half hours. There we go. Exactly. Uh, there we go. Strap in, everybody. <laughs> strap in, everybody. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Pod Friends. That was the song Pod Friends by Will from America. Shout out to Will. And I'm your host, Matt Scott. You could find me on social media at Matt Scott GW, at Hey Pod Friends, if there's anything that you want to reach out about or tweet. And first and foremost, uh, as we settle in for this episode of Pod Friends, which you could see is um, definitely the longest so far, um, I want to ask, how are you doing? You know, think about it. Like, take a second. I want to know, how are you doing? I ask that because I feel like so often a lot of us are like going through it. Um, life is is sometimes difficult the holidays are sometimes difficult um and i feel like i'm especially in this mode um just because of this week's episode with the one the only mike bloom and um just to really get into it i'll be honest and transparent with you all um before recording this intro i kind of had to stop and just like write out my thoughts because there was so much that i wanted to say for so many reasons and I far be it for me to want to keep you from the interview I, and the conversation truly with Mike, this was truly a conversation. Um, but you know, there was a lot that I just wanted to say up front, which is that Mike is, is someone that I legitimately love and someone who I wish I had so much more time with. Like, I think that when people think of, the podcast. Rob has a podcast. Um, and again, I feel like this is like maybe one of the most self-referential podcasts on the network. But when people think of the Rob has a podcast network and the podcasters, you know, I think sometimes people think that we have so much time together and opportunities to connect. Um, or sometimes people don't even think about it. But, you know, the thing that I really appreciate is that, um, you know, there are just a lot of people that you meet. And Pod Friends is the opportunity for me to get to know a lot of people better, get to have that uninterrupted time um, with people that I've never had uh, before. And Mike is someone, like I said, who I legitimately love. And for me, um, I almost have this mentality that's like, protect Mike Bloom at all costs. Um, because everyone knows and sees the fun, the wit, the smart sides of Mike. But I've always always like loved and appreciated the huge heart that he has. And I think for me, that's the part that shines so much in this episode of Pod Friends. Um, whether it's like talking with Mike about our shared experiences of New Jersey, where I'm initially from um, before moving to Washington, D.C., or whether it's talking about his appreciation for 
um, the Pod Friends intros and comparing them to T Bird Cooper. Shout out to T Bird, uh, former guest of Pod Friends, uh, host of Talking with T Bird. Um, or whether it's Mike thinking about how to create mentorship opportunities for newer podcasters, like people in the class of 2020, like me. There's just so much about Mike that um, I love and admire and appreciate. And, um, you know, he's really one of a kind. He's one of one. And this episode of Pod Friends similarly is one of a kind. I don't, honestly, I don't know if there will ever be a podcast that's just like this. And actually, I think each of them is its own unique thing. But you'll see that this is really a powerful one and um, gets really, really personal and deep, which Mike um, thankfully does so often on podcasts. And I think that it opens up doors for people like me, people like you to talk about the issues that we talk about. So as you'll hear, this conversation starts out very fun and unhinged, mostly on my part. And as Mike points out, I am going full bloom. Um, I did not edit anything out. Um, so I hope you appreciate just everything along the way as we kind of got swept away in talking with one another. I loved how Mike, um, even before we recorded, kind of said, look, I don't have a hard stop at the end of uh, the time that we had scheduled. So we just kept going and going and going. And um, just being in Mike's presence was so comforting and powerful. Um, and his energy is contagious. And I really love this conversation and all it was. So I don't want to keep you back from that. I do want to stop and just offer a massive trigger warning for folks. There's a lot in this discussion about mental health, about suicide, and, you know, kind of to the point of something that we talk about in this episode. If you're not in the best place right now, um, mentally, emotionally, if you're just not feeling your best, maybe hold off on listening to this episode or hold off on watching this episode. You know, it's a lot. It goes places. And um, instead of taking time with this episode, you know, you can come back to it when you're in that space. Um, you know, just take time to consume the things that you love, the things that bring your your emotions up, that make you feel good, um, especially if you are you feel like you're getting uh, overwhelmed or feeling those emotions along the way. It's okay to stop. It's okay to pause and come back to it. Um, I do love that um, despite talking about those things, um, you know, we really also talk about coping strategies and um, some of the other beautiful things uh, that you know, that that are going on in Mike's life. And so this podcast, as I'll say, is not a replacement for therapy or professional support. I am not a therapist. And like Mike, I can't advocate for therapy enough. One of the things I just want to mention is that, um, you know, you're not alone. I think that oftentimes uh, people, myself included, feel, you know, lonely. We feel like people don't value us or care for us as much as we do. And there are people out there who care for you, who move mountains for you. Um, I feel like, you know, and Mike and I talk about this, but um, there's just so much, um, so much meaning that that Mike has even had for me beyond the podcasting time we've had together. I messaged him this after the fact, but like I started listening to listening to RHAP in 2017, very shortly after my dad died, and just having like Mike's voice, Rob's voice, all of these voices in my head, um, friends in my head that ultimately would become friends was so meaningful. And so I say that to say that um, you as listeners know this, but um, often, you know, as podcasters, we don't hear from all the people about how much we mean to them. And so, um, I'm kind of rambling here a little bit, but you know, part of that is um, just encouraging you to reach out and uh, show love and to kind of uh, let Mike know kind of how this resonates with you. But also for you, um, you know, to to reach out to the resources that are there for you. Um, I am including a link to the National Suicide Prevention Hotline, which has chat options, phone options. You could find it at 988lifeline.org, and I'll include more in the show notes. 
Again, very powerful episode. I, I really can't even wait to listen back with all of you and excited to, to hear from you about how this lands and resonates, what you learn, what you gain, and kind of the impact it has on you um, because that's really what this is about. So I know this is a long intro. Um, you can imagine it's for good reason. But um, now I'm going to dive in to my introduction for this really powerful, amazing conversation with someone who's so dear to me, who I love, the one and only Mike Bloom. Making his way to the podcast, hailing from the mean streets of Connecticut, he's a theater kid at heart, an improv legend, a survivor aficionado, a scholar of the hit series Lost, a podcaster with Rob, has a podcast since 2014, and go-to journalist with Parade Magazine, who's covered Survivor, Big Brother, The Amazing Race, Dancing with the Stars, Top Chef, The Challenge, and more, with published work in The Hollywood Reporter, comic book resources, outside cinema and more beyond the work he does where he really shines is in who he is a stellar human a proponent of therapy a husband a dad a man that is loved and admired by you and me and so much more some know him as the website consultant mr x but you may know him as the man who goes full bloom so that you can too please welcome Mike Bloom. Local recordings of podcasts that are just sitting on my computer that never, you know, like they, they've never gone anywhere. No one's but ever those used are, them. Those are memories, you know? Inevitably, when Skynet wipes us all out and we're looking for the repository of media that we once had that has now been wiped out in the great, you know, EMP of 20. Yeah. 32 then mm -hmm. we'll be able to say well at least i had that local recording of that one wrestling wrap up from may 9th 2021 well so my thing is um and you know similar vein i'm imagining because it's it's just the recording of my side of the audio so yeah like Inevitably, when Mari and I have a falling out, but I still want to go back and listen to the wrestling we're half up, I could just listen to my side of the audio. There you go. It's perfectly satiating your nostalgia yet egocentricity of like, mm -hmm. well, I, I remember this, but remember what I was saying specifically back then? I don't want to listen to that, that other side of things. Do you, do you think? Do you think people want to hear just like one side? Because I look, we've all had it where it's like, you know. You know, Matt was great on that podcast, as always. He's amazing, but Mike sucks. I just want to hear Matt's side oh, of the well, conversation. Oh, well, thank you for filling in uh, all of the blanks that many commenters have said over the past 10 years. I was going to uh, say, just like triggering your anxiety exactly, and, and uh, trauma and all the things. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting because I have certainly recorded with people, obviously, mm -hmm. who record in close proximity of their loved ones. And sometimes mm -hmm. they're like, oh, it's interesting to be in the same room i mean that's something that i get a lot when i met or saw again peter gus uh with shannon yeah. in dc a, a few months ago like mm -hmm. he said oh it's interesting to like hear both sides of the conversation instead of just <laughs> one uh, so it's almost like the opposite right where for a long time they're experiencing one yeah. side of the conversation and i guess that becomes and it also becomes a bit of um bob newhart used to do this but it's a it's an mm -hmm. acting exercise one of the toughest things to do as an actor is to pretend that you're on the phone uh because okay. There's no one on the other side. Mm -hmm. You have to not only act natural like a normal person, but at the same time, you have to simulate what someone else is saying on the other line, right? You almost have to think out the other side of that conversation. And that's kind of what you're doing in that exercise, right? If you're talking about it, of okay, I like half the podcast, but then I have to think about what the other half is saying. And so if you want to do that mental gymnastics, good for you. Me, I just rather make my brain go into autopilot mode in that way and just make sure that I can hear both sides of the conversation. I have to say, Mike, uh, Bob Newhart is quite the reference. Uh, and I, 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 he's still alive. He's still around. I don't know still if you knew him. that. Still, still kicking, probably going to keep going for a long time. 93 years old. Uh, God, uh, someone bless, uh, I was going to say God bless Bob Newhart, but I, I, I'm not that religious. I'm not religious at all, actually. So bless Bob Newhart. Thank you. Shout out to him if he's listening. I just have to point out 
I've married. I interviewed Marianne. I was gonna say I married Marianne, but wow. Uh, okay, I, well, I married Marianne. Lord my... Connor just got cuckolded. Wow. Look, honestly, look, I'm trying to to slide into to Marianne's Valentine's Day just in time. But yes, I married Marianne uh-huh. uh, on the first episode of Pod Friends for this season. Check it out if you haven't. And, you know, I'm not even going to correct myself on that. Uh, but talking with Marianne, she talked about how weird she is and all these things. And I feel like everyone who is within this, like, Rob has a podcast, Survivor podcasting, other podcasting universe is, like, kind of weird. But, I, Mike, I have to say, Bob Newhart reference is kind of a, a kind of that, weird reference. Not that's, typical. That's the indicator. I have done 10 that's years the weirdest of thing. stupid, silly, goofy, <laughs> out there years. shenanigans. <laughs> And you are like, well, I think the Bob Newhart reference really shows your <laughs> that is the tip of the iceberg, if that's an indication. But yeah, I I agree. I mean, for a number of reasons, I think, yeah, I think you have to be a little weird to put yourself out there. Uh, just because I think as humans, uh, maybe with the exception of like certain star signs that you mm-hmm. have, we're not the the ones to necessarily like put ourselves on the the main stage right put ourselves in the spotlight for a myriad of reasons and yeah. so i think to d- defy that human condition almost indicates that like yeah there's there's something unique about you as there should be uh obviously <laughs> i think people like to sympathize with the voices that they hear but i do think that there is certainly like a je ne sais quoi about mm. some of the best podcasters out there that feel relatable Yet at the same time, not necessarily uh, akin to like a person you run into in your real life. Yeah. Wow, Mike, that was such a great compliment to me. Uh, thank <laughs> you so much for calling me one of the best. Po- Hold on, I need to deepen my voice. Thank you so much, Mike, for calling me one of the best podcasts. Listen, you have you have a much more world, salacious podcast squad. host than I do. So no matter what you know tone or timbre it was at, it was bound mm. to be much better than my nasally ass i was gonna say it's a little bit too seductive uh, right now so i have All to right, watch uh, out, pitch it up to my normal <laughs> <laughs> say, you're the you're the one that's going full bloom in the first like five minutes of this thing which is i don't know if that's me rubbing off on you that's or you, you rubbing off on me yeah i'm embodied with the spirit uh so yeah, yeah. i'm happy that you could do the work for me in that way <laughs> well look look i feel like i the one of the things i love about uh pod friends let's talk about pod friends in pod friends that's like the that's that's what pod friends is just the med- the most meta podcast on RHAP, I would hope. Um, uh, I don't know. Renap kind of has you beat <laughs> considering like okay. the existing lore. I would say you're, yes. <laughs> I mean, if they're sort of like the, I don't know, they're sort of like the Catholicism mm-hmm. and you're like when Henry VIII split things off to be like, all right, I'm going to do my own thing for a little bit. Uh, so you're still similarly meta, but I do feel like the, the tweets no. connect back to that central trunk of just a podcast that is continually referring upon itself. All I'm going to say is uh, this is season three of Pod Friends, and I'm just calling my shot. I want Akiva on season three, episode seven. Talk about someone who is very unique and uh, has his voice out there as a podcaster. I think that is like exhibit A of what I was talking about beforehand. Look, look, Mike. You mentioned there's a lot that we've we've died. To see. We could just end it right here. And this could be the shortest episode of Pod Friends, which Marianne would be upset about because her episode ended up by, by a few minutes. Probably. Actually, I'm not going to go back and check if it's true. But it's the shortest episode of Pod Friends, if you ask me. So I'm Wow. Saying, interesting. Yeah, she's a record breaker on both both ends of things. Uh, but you you you've been doing this almost 10 years. You've been doing this almost 10 years. You're uh, you have weird things about you that you hinted at. You haven't touched on those. God, just the idea. I'm see, Mike. I have like your nipples in my the the, the phrasing. I need to, Mike. Yeah, I mean, follow follow that train of thought. I'm intrigued to see what station you end up dropping yourself <laughs> off at with there. <laughs> well, I'm just saying. Like, I want to know. You know, you kind of hinted at, it, but like. What is weird or different about you? I feel like this is a good, uh, maybe a good theme for the Pod Friends season. <laughs> um, yeah, let's talk with all the weirdest people. This is our yeah. experimental season where we Do talk it. with just the outright <laughs> odd jobs, odd balls. That's right. That's on our right. HAP in the in the uh, in the podcasting and reality TV world community. It's a theme. I mean, it's a it's a great question. I am definitely someone who is. I would say like a product 
of uh, nature and nurture mm -hmm. in that way, in that, you know, I, before getting into podcasting, came from a theater background, came from especially an improv background yeah. where, especially with the improv I studied, uh, the concept is A to C, right? Uh, it's not this idea of A to B and B mm. to C. Eventually, you condition your brain to sort of take out the middleman and jump directly from A to C. So like, for mm -hmm. example, if I'm given the word orange, I think, okay, orange fruit. And then I'd go, uh, I'm not sure, like fruit pyramid, because I'm mm. thinking about the, the no yeah. longer an existent food pyramid. And so the A to C would be orange to pyramid. And it's a little obtuse to think about it again on paper of like, how the hell did that happen? But mm -hmm. it's, it's cutting out those middle steps. And that's kind of the way my brain thinks uh yeah. is definitely trying to sort of make that immediate jump in when someone's telling me something or i'm digesting a piece of information but then like immediately jumping off of that and thinking a lot in what ifs and a lot of really stupid scenarios uh which yeah. is just sort of like how i live my life from a nature perspective i mean i definitely was always a very unique thinker uh you know i am and was the first in my family to really pursue any sort of like career in the arts or entertainment mm. uh putting your voice out there as yeah. i mentioned before but i have a very you know goofy family very dry very sarcastic very silly very different thinking in terms of like not the world but just like the goofiness that we had within our household when i was growing up and so i feel like it was sort of a merging mm. of those two things where I grew up in this environment where like goofing around and not being serious was something that we did on a daily, albeit like minute by minute basis. And then I moved into a culture where it was a lot about thinking outside the box. And I think bringing those ideas into podcasting, which was very nerve wracking at first, at first, because, you know, Matt, you know this as well as anybody else who yeah. puts themselves out there that being yourself, and expressing your own opinions, especially when you're someone that is new to the game, can be very scary. There yeah. is a supreme lack of confidence because you were just afraid of the veritable tiger pit that is the internet to just like tear you to shreds for expressing your yeah. opinions. So uh, for me, I was able to, the more I sort of talked about it, and I feel this way about actually, uh, you know, one of your hopeful future guests, Akiva, as well. Yeah. There's this idea of me not even realizing that, like, my own thinkings were weird and out there until I talk with other people. And it's like, oh, you don't think that way. Yeah. You did not automatically jump to that thing. Interesting. And so it was an opportunity, much as a lot of podcasting for me, uh, an opportunity to, like, look within myself and realize that the way I think is quite different from your layman. Uh, yeah. And even just the, the other people that I have the great opportunity of sharing the mic with. Yeah. And I think that the, that what's so beautiful about that is like embracing the weird, like talking with Marianne. One thing that was so interesting is like, I was like, Marianne, not to put words in your mouth, but like, are, you know, you call yourself weird. Are you weird? Do you still think of yourself as weird? And she was very offended by the idea of me taking her weird card away, which <laughs> you have to appreciate because it's just different. It's being unique. It's bringing something uh, that is outside the box to the table. And, you know, you bring up something that's, I think, really important for, like, listeners to understand, which is, you know, one of the reasons I do pod friends. It's like, we are people. We're humans. We have a great time doing these I don't these know. I, like, you talk about how weird I am. I might as well be an alien. For I mean, I, <laughs> I, was, I was actually just listening to you from uh, 2017 on Whoa. the Terran show. Yeah, I was gonna say, like, yes. I was trying to think when you asked me to do this about yes. when the last time I did one of these was. <laughs> and yeah, it was five years ago, and Holy yeah. crap, a uh -huh. lot has changed with me in the past five years. Yeah, so I would encourage people to go back and check out that episode of The Terran Show, November 18th, 2017, Mike. I don't know wow. if you knew that's when it's published, but that's what I, happened. I did not that's realize that. Yeah, that's so yeah, over, over five years. Only five years? Wow, it feels like... I feel like I've, I've aged probably both in terms of the color of my hair and just my... I don't even want to say maturity because we were just talking how weird I am, but like my <laughs> awareness of myself in the world has changed so much in five years. Wow. Life is 
strange only five years my well God. that's yeah it's like it's it's interesting yeah it's that was a long time ago honestly for me 2017 in terms of a conversation that my my uh dad not to go somber on us but my dad passed away in early 2017 my life yeah. has been beautiful in so challenging and beautiful in so many ways since and i'm so thankful for that but like the idea of 2017 is so far back five plus almost six years away actually six years away from january whatever 2017 so it has been a minute and it's like so much evolves and changes mike how old are you now i am 33 33 so i'm 30 and there's even that shift that comes with just the your age going from 20 27 28 to 33 what has the what's okay big question generally though but like what's different about you from 2017 to 2023 oh man it oh is God. so a shade. lot a lot has changed i mean that's an understatement it's actually really coincidental I got a text from a friend yesterday who I was in an improv group with one of my good friends, moved out to L.A., uh, now, you know, does a bunch of uh, production things. And he texted me being like, you know, I always thought I should write a short about your life. And I'm like, <laughs> like, I'm not Benjamin Button, you know, I'm not um, Walter Mitty. Uh, me? You want to do a short about right. me? But I do think about the past five years, and I'm still not saying that I'm like, you know, biopic worthy by by any stretch of the imagination. But you are. It's, oh, well, thank you. It truly is wild, though, thinking about what has happened to me specifically in the past five years, because in November 2017, mm. uh, I had just started doing exit press for survivor for survivor 35 mm -hmm. just started doing the bnb uh i was living in new york at the time and then flash forward in the past five years obviously having a child was the top of that list in terms of things that have changed right. moved out of the city now residing in a state that you and i matt both yes. talk out every single time we see each other in person uh yeah, in the state. garden state mm -hmm. i'm in full bloom in the garden state so it only makes sense Ooh. And I mean, listen, without sounding too big for my britches about it, I think I have become one of the like consummate reality TV journalists, which mm. is something I never, ever would have expected, as well as getting to experience a wealth of opportunities. I think that's how I would define the past five years are opportunities, things like getting to go out onto set for Survivor and do yeah. preseason interviews with the cast and getting to meet production and interview production and participate in a challenge. Uh, getting to be a part of Survivor South Africa production as a production consultant, helping actually shape a season beforehand behind the scenes. Getting to interview all of these different celebrities and contestants and hosts that I have been watching yeah. on TV since I was 10 years old. There's just been a, a fantastic broad sense of things that I have been able to do only through a short five years. And right. yeah, again, it's it's odd thinking about the time frame because I guess I'm just doing so much that it feels like I've been doing it forever. But really, it only started ramping up, ironically enough, I would say around 2017 because i think mm. from the survivor you know covering survivor came covering big brother and then covering the amazing race and then it's just been very you know incredibly snowballing from there and i am so incredibly happy with mm. where i am right now i mean look we could talk about my my mental state how sometimes that still kind of ebbs and flows totally. but i know that there are people out there that have career woes mm -hmm. that have you know their own occupational hazards that have difficulties with like figuring out what they want to do mm -hmm. i count my lucky stars and the quasars <laughs> and the planets yeah. and the galaxies that i have somehow fallen ass backwards into getting this opportunity to talk about reality shows scripted shows i mean well you know we're still doing lost down the hatch but that first yeah. run where josh and i covered lost in its entirety for over like 300 hours is one of the most fulfilling projects i've ever done uh -huh. from a creative perspective let alone a podcasting perspective 
And so my cup not only runneth over, it's like mm -hmm. spilling over into a, other glasses in the cabinet. I have to put pots underneath. Like it's on oh my roof to just like tr try to catch everything that I have been so fortunate to be able to, to take in over the past five years. So, you know, long story short, which I feel like is another good subtitle for this podcast, <laughs> I would say it's really been defined for me by opportunity. And I am someone who always views like yourself, your made through your experiences. Yeah. Uh, I am someone who tries to look at if something bad happens, I look at it as, you know, an opportunity to learn, to grow. And so no opportunity wasted is probably how I've been living, you know, my life the past five years is I have been so fortunate yeah. to have a lot of doors open for me and get the opportunity to explore things I never thought I would do in my life. And I am just so grateful to not only those that have allowed me that opportunity, but especially those that have been able to partake in said content and at least kind of put up with me so that I continue <laughs> to take advantage of these opportunities for, you know, five, 10, 15 years down the line. Yeah. And it's, it's amazing. Like knowing you now to the going from when I first started listening to RHAP in 2017 to like even having this conversation with you where, I mean, as a listener, especially as a listener who's not like super tapped into the community, you're hearing all these different voices and names and, you know, like Mike Bloom's a name in your head, but you're like, oh, which one's Mike? And I would never be able to put a, I would yeah, have with, never at the time. Which straight white guy on the right JP is Mike Bloom? That's a is fun it, guess. Is it too. Josh Wiggler? Is, yeah, it Mike? is it, which one's Rob? Which one's Mike? I mean, I, I have, you yeah. know, when I've had the pleasure of meeting listeners at these live shows, yeah. a lot of uh, sizable <laughs> do tell me like, oh, I thought you look more like Josh Wiggler in real life. So I'm not sure if they just assume all of us kind of have the same look to us when it comes to podcasters. There's that, oh, that, that. there's that meme, right? Of okay, all podcasts are hosted by the same three guys. And I think it's a meme of uh it's Big Al from Toy Story, mm -hmm. right? It's the dad from uh from Inside Out with like the mustache, and then it's Linguini from Ratatouille. And <laughs> I obviously fall into the last bucket. Uh, yeah, I've well. dressed up like Linguini a couple times back when I used to grow up my hair, big old Jufro Ooh. emerged. And so I, I, I quite it. literally resemble Linguini. So yeah, uh, I guess they assumed I was more like the Al's, from Al's Toy Barn though, than the Linguini. Wow. And you know what? I have to say, we do look a lot alike. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, maybe I hope no one's watching the video right now because I just want you to picture twins. Yep. We're, we're there you go. twinning full on. Uh, same podcast setup. Yep. Uh, that's what we do. Mike, what do you, you know, as you kind of talk, you talk through a little bit of like the opportunity and some of the things that have evolved and changed. And there's a lot there um, that that's evolved as you've talked about. But one thing I want to ask is that you described yourself back in 2017. See, I come with the, hold on, I need a piece of paper. I know. I, I come with the receipts, Mike. Back wow, in, back, our copy and everything. Yeah, I, I definitely I definitely own a print. I don't own a printer, I'm a fucking millennial. Like why would I, but. My oh, see I, see, I have to own a printer because I don't know how I pull off, again, my stupid outfit ideas for the Amazing Race podcast where I'm not having a printer. All of it is just paper and tape. The rest <laughs> of it is just a facade, people. Well, so this is this is like this is part of what I want to ask Mike because I think in in even I could have well I think a lot of people could appreciate your evolution and growth as much changes a lot stays the same we love all of it but you described yourself as high energy manic and excitable would you still describe yourself today as being high energy, manic, and excitable? That was kind of how you summed yourself up back in 2017, believe it or not. Ooh, uh, excitable. Takes a little <laughs> bit more to get me excitable nowadays, mainly Whoa. because being, well, being the parent of a toddler, I think I need a little bit more caffeine in me uh, than I mm -hmm. did back in 2017. But mm -hmm. otherwise, yeah, I would say so. I mean, I've always been a very high energy person. I have trouble controlling the volume of my voice as my wife is uh, happy to let me know basically every <laughs> other day of the week. And so I do yeah. think I do think I walk into things still with like an exuberance, a bit of wide eyed, uh, as big of a smile as I can afford. And 
Manic is interesting. That's an interesting You said that. Term. You said that. No, I wasn't, I'm, I'm not blaming you. I'm blaming 2017. Oh, I know. <laughs> Manic. I mean, yeah, I could see it to, to a certain extent. Because I do think, you know, obviously, as has been showcased over the past 25 minutes or so i do like to yeah. ramble my brain is like it. a kid crossing a river hopping from rock to rock all the time and so Fun. i guess i would define that as manic i don't know i'm trying to think of like i don't know when i first think of manic i think more so just like can't figure out what to do so just trying to do everything at once i think i've become a little more settled down and organized in my thinking that's perhaps wishful thinking yeah Man yeah i guess maybe less manic less excitable but definitely more high energy i would say uh or not more mm. high energy is at the same level of energy which was already high we don't need more energy look i love it and you know what they say the best part of waking up is mike bloom in your cup um that 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 was the first thing that crossed my mind this morning mike i just had to share that with you uh so should i, should I do more morning shows then is that should i yes. get like your cup of joe should i be the thing that gets everybody up in the morning literally that's that's all that the people want and all that they need um so we'll, we'll, we'll work on it we'll work on a concept um this is kind of like morning show-esque like maybe you, you could well, have a we, pod we are recording thing. in the morning so we are we are it's a morning show really for us i don't know for anybody else they can listen to it literally anytime they want to. <laughs> it, yeah i guess that's true but Honestly, I think we're coming coming a little hot for people to listen to this as like their nighttime routine. Like I, I'm hoping no one's falling asleep to this podcast. Oh, I mean, I am. What if they are good for them. I'm incredibly surprised whenever somebody says like, "Oh yeah, I fall asleep listening to your podcast," just because again, listen to this voice. Listen to this, what I'm yeah. saying right now. Do you really think that people are like, ah, yes, time to go off to dreamland with this David Cross on helium sounding man, a guy <laughs> who sounds like he's been holding his nose every time he utters a syllable out of his mouth. How dare you, Mike? I don't. I don't appreciate this. I feel like I'm. I, I'm. I'm becoming defensive of you and your beautiful voice. Your voice Aww. is. Your voice is lovely. People love to listen to it. Like I and I will say I can relate to this. Uh, people might have noticed we have different voices. So they could tell the difference between the two of us. So we do look the same, though. We look the same, but we sound a little bit different on purpose. Because how else would this podcast make any sense? But you know, I could relate to that. Where it's like, yeah, yeah, hear your voice and. There was a long time in my life where I like heard my voice. It's like I don't like to hear myself record it. And then I just got freaking used to it. And I was yeah. like, wow, okay, that's the that's the the unique uh tones of Matt Scott, the unique tones of Mike Bloom. And so Oh, that it's sounds like I'm releasing some sort of bad like Mike Bloom sings the standards and it's me in like a rat pack suit trying you haven't... to sing fly, fly me to the moon or something. I'm surprised you haven't done that yet. I, no, I mean, listen, there is a different multiverse, right? Because I forget if I talked about this five years ago, but Maybe. of course, my my origin story, right, was that I uh, had been acting since I was like eight yeah. years old, uh, got into it, uh, got went through college, got a degree in it and everything, did it for a couple of years, and then just sort of realized this is not something I wanted to do permanently. But yeah. If I had gone down that path uh, and I, I saw the different version of myself, yeah, maybe I would try to put out some sort of crooner album in 20 in the 2020s, which just sounds like a recipe for disaster in many ways. I mean, I you're we're coming up with something just like brainstorming in real time. And honestly, if anyone hears this, feel free to organize this. But I do think there could be an RHAP album, you know, like the oh, greatest definitely. hits. Like, you know, you could have a song. Maybe you could be on all of the songs if you really want. Just, honestly. Yeah, of course. That's what <laughs> just put me on. All right. We're going to, Shannon, you're, we're bringing you on. But yeah. here's the thing. I've got to be on every, I want to be the DJ Khaled. Ooh. Right, just come on in the middle of every song. And yeah. uh, truly the most self-serving thing I could possibly ever do. And I've been podcasting for 10 years. So that says a lot. If RHAP, or if you were in like an RHAP uh, band, you know, like a, a just a small group. Who, like, who, we don't have to have a limit. This could be like Menudo. Um, you know, how met who who would be in our group because i need to be in it mike okay, i don't know what, what, what's your instrument uh, instrument my, well, my, book, my beautiful voice oh yeah mike. i guess i realized yeah i realized that i guess you know boy bands do oh is the is the kettle on what is that <laughs> uh yeah i 
I guess, yeah, I, when I think about band, I think I, I guess I more so think about like a rock band and less so about an aforementioned Menudo oh, or a, a Backstreet Boys, right? Where like, yeah, nobody's playing instruments. Okay, so you can be in it. Uh, I do think, listen, like, Shannon Gus can't not sing on every Australian Survivor podcast. Or I think rap. She, um, she raps beautifully, by the way. Okay, so I think to that note, I think bring Phil T on as mm, well. Okay, there might be some conflict there between the two rappers, or they could collab. But yeah, well, listen, the rappers and beef go together in so many great ways. Uh, if there's no beef, there's no rap, as rap expert Mike Bloom puts it. <laughs> I was like, I'm not trying to end up in the middle of any rap beef. I'm also not trying to make any uh, any jokes about uh, beef and rap and all the things. Rap beef and rap beef as well. Oh my god. Yeah, Mike, who are you feuding with? Who do you want to call out right now? Uh, oh boy. Yeah, exactly. This is the, the pod friends is the opportunity to more so like WWE style, right? True to your wheelhouse, Matt. Yes. Like call someone up, be like, all right, I'm taking you in the rig. Yeah, that's a, no, we're really gonna start. So we look, I, I I hope that people are imagining who could be who could be part of the group, the band. Phil T is a good choice. Shannon, uh I feel like Aaron Robertson could come in here. Oh, with Aaron some Robertson would be perf perfect. Perfect. Amon. Pitch. Amon. Amon. Ooh, Amon. Yes, we have a long list. We'll work on this later offline. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I have the whiteboard out right now, uh, just scribbling ideas. This is a million dollar idea, and Rob's not ready for it. RHAP is not ready for it. So we'll figure no, it out. No, absolutely not. It still needs to incubate. Yes, it needs to incubate. And uh, speaking of incubating, um, I see I could transition perfectly to talking about fatherhood, but I'm not going to do that. Oh, come on. It was right there. Call, well, no. my, wife, call my wife a chicken, Matt. Go ahead. <laughs> Come on, we're a well, sorry, I was here. like, I don't like, I don't, I don't all, all of the, the metaphors here are, get a little complicated. I, I want to go back to something that you mentioned, though, uh, before we get into <laughs> the fatherhood, because that's a, mm -hmm. there's a lot to talk about um, yeah. with that, I'm sure. But, you know, uh, speaking of incubating, you, you've you incubated your podcasting career. You talked about some of the opportunities that have come up uh, and, you know, you referenced Fly Me to the Moon. You've flown to Fiji. I, I would imagine it was in Fiji. You've flown to Fiji, though. You've been close to Survivor. You've been part of this community, interviewing people. And something that I've experienced that I'm curious to kind of hear your thoughts on is this past season of Survivor uh, was one where more than any other, I feel like I've gotten to know different players or I've spent time around the players a huge part of that being being an RHAP <laughs> podcaster uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, and just being at some of these community events but I want to ask you like what was that like for you going through that because for me it is nerve-wracking it is strange it's like I don't want to be spoiled on the season I'm not going to talk but I also want to talk with you exclusively about Survivor because that's all anyone wants to do um, what was that like for you going from being just a fan and someone who I know uh you know kind of watched uh you know in the corners uh hidden out from the rest of society mm -hmm. uh to being this person who's actually so close to the action and actually kind of you know interacting with the characters that we're, we're seeing yeah so suffice it to say it was uh a very low self-esteem start uh just because it was it was a brand there. new experience yeah. for me and i give all the credit in the world to josh wiggler who mm. I, out of the blue out of the bloom at some point in like 2016 i had reached out to him and i was like you know i'm sort of thinking like do i want to get into journalism you know i've been podcasting for a couple of years really enjoyed it at the end of the day i like just speaking with people which i think has parlayed into all these you know great things that i get to do and so I was very fortunate in that he, you know, was vacating his post at Parade, moving on to The Hollywood Reporter yeah. at the time and had recommended me for the job. And I was so nervous at first because, to your point, there is a lot of like, I don't know, imposter syndrome or just yeah. a lot of questioning of, OK, am I asking the right questions? Am I taking the right tone here? But something clicked for me and not to say I didn't feel confident in my skills beforehand but season mm. 39 is important in in many ways yeah. I had flown out there and interviewed these contestants and that unlocked something for me where of course like you know Josh yeah. did a great job on first one out and uh, always great preseason stuff but this was the first time where like 
I was actually sitting down and talking with them as people. Yeah. And it made me realize why I wanted to do this. And I, I tell this to contestants now all the time uh, when I get the pleasure of meeting them and, and, and talking with them, uh, particularly in person, which is, you know, their stories out there are boiled down to 42 minutes at a time. And it's less so now, but in the past, definitely sometimes they might be pigeonholed into certain roles they have to play to fit a narrative. Mm -hmm. From my perspective, I am there to have them tell their story. Yeah. Everyone has a story out there. Everyone has a narrative. And I want to be that conduit. I do not want to be the person that's like inserting myself into conversations. If anything, I want to use my personality to make them feel comfortable. Uh, so that they can express themselves, so they can tell their own personal truth. And again, that really came to light during season 39 with, of course, all of, you know, the terrible controversy yeah. that came around. There was a lot of stuff around what production was and was not, you know, telling people or uh, even on the island as well. And it just sort of clicked for me in getting at that time a unique opportunity to talk with some contestants as well. You know, it, it took a little bit of finagling. I yeah. remember a couple were done via email instead of phone interviews. Matt, you know, firsthand how yeah. different those types of things can be. Mm -hmm. But it all sort of clicked for me that getting to know these people months before anyone else did, getting to sit down across a nice folding table out in the middle of the Fijian jungle with them looking in their eyes and getting to know them as a person before a character made me realize what I like to do in terms of interviewing, which is, yes, there are questions that we want them to answer about their game, about, you know, the, the way they're being portrayed, et cetera. But just to, to have them tell their side yeah. of the story and express their narrative and express their side of history in a manner of speaking. And I feel fortunate that I was able to do that a little bit, especially with the season 39 stuff when stuff got cleared out. Uh, another one I'm proud of is, you know, when Jackson had his very unconventional yeah. exit from Survivor 42. Uh, you know, I came at him the next day with a lot of clarifying questions as to what exactly was happening. Mm -hmm. And he, he handled it with so much grace and he answered every single one of them. And I felt incredibly proud about for him. And I felt incredibly proud about that interview as well. Those are the ones I feel, I think, most proud of is when people feel like they get an opportunity to just talk about their own journey uh, outside of perhaps the edit that we get to see. Again, maybe they are answering questions of why did you blindside this person? Right. What were you feeling when you went through this? But at the same time, now they're unencumbered. Yes, there may be a time limit to these interviews, but at the same time, they're within the comfort of their own home. They're talking to what hopefully they're perceiving as as a friendly face. And it gives them the opportunity to speak from the heart, hopefully, mm -hmm. and be able to speak past the boundaries that sometimes this show imparts on them from an aired perspective. Wow, Mike. I love it. I love it so much. I love it. I love, like, hearing this from you and even just love um, this. Well, I love... Oh, God. Uh, take it out of context if you want REGP out of context. I love every side of you, Mike. And I think that I, I, uh, I think that like one of the things I appreciate most, though, is um, this aspect of you, which I feel like people in the podcasting world and, you know, you, you there's there's so much nuance to you, Mike, and how you show up. But also so often there's the fun lighthearted bringing that uh it, like the just the fun into podcasts at times and i think that other side of things that's not the performer but the person who's like let me give that other person a platform is something that's really interesting to me as someone who interviews people and uh similarly is like all about giving people the space to share their story in whatever way that is, uh, whether it's the things you expect or the things you don't expect. And I don't know if you've talked about this before, but like, what was it that, do you know what it was that drew you to interviewing people specifically? Um, because, you know, you're, you've been doing it for a while, which is awesome. But, you know, mm -hmm. what was that, that spark? Because I, I realize not everyone is that is, is as curious about uh, other people's stories. Yeah, I think it was just for me, 
realizing that podcasting was essentially conversations with hitting the record button before and after it that you know i get to talk about these things that i love in a context that does get released to the public but really it's usually just a back and forth thing that sometimes i can prepare points etc i'll take notes but i mean my thing as well is that i am a very reactive person uh it's really interesting so i've gotten a lot into D D in the past yeah. you know a few years just joined a dm philly stream on a more permanent basis but you know in D D, you usually create characters you usually come up with a backstory class race you know mm -hmm. pick abilities etc every D D character i played in the past few years i've kind of like had someone basically like make it for me because that's something that didn't interest me i am someone that is much more likely to say hey again sure this improv background like throw something at me and let me see how i can field the ball as opposed to okay let me be the one to prepare and do this thinking perhaps it is a time thing that i just have so many things that i don't know from a mental space perspective how much time i can dedicate to, to thinking through these things but i also am very you know grateful that i am quick enough on my feet that I feel like I can field a lot of balls that are hit my way. And so mm. I think for me, it was a lot of just being in the moment in a manner of speaking. I'm not having to like console my notes or think about what happens next and yeah. more so just listening back to the person and engaging with them on that level that I think did draw me to interviewing. And of course, I've always been interested in reading interviews. I think it also helps Again, it it seems like, you know, an obvious statement because I think we're very grateful that a lot of reality TV journalists out there are fans of the shows that they right. cover. But I think it, it certainly does help as well. It helps to be, especially for for something like Big Brother, for example. Uh, oh, you know, yeah. Something like the live feeds can often tell an incredibly right. different story than the aired show. And so I think being able to be someone that, has so much love and passion for the show, sometimes, you know, equaling these super duper fans that go out there and play the game. You know, I have been so honored to receive the comments several times of like, thank you for asking the questions that I would have asked. And I think yeah. that really helps as well as like having a genuine interest in these things combined with just the desire to have a conversation with them and to just chat with them and, and will be happening to talk about, you know, their reality TV game at the time but i think just talking back and forth to somebody is one of my favorite things to do i am a social butterfly by nature and so just add on to that the inquisitiveness that comes with being a fan uh -huh. of these shows and i think it, it ended up being a match made in heaven wow i love it and it's uh I, and i love how you you mentioned just the idea of like that's the question that the the listener would have won asked and and that's one of the things i love about being able to interview is to at least for my, I guess for myself, selfishly, to ask the questions that I would have wanted want to ask, but I also really appreciate hearing from people who um, who that resonates with, and that's why I have to ask Mike about these interviews. Number one, is there is there are there any highlights or any um, interviews that you're most proud of? Anyone you connect with, you're like, damn, that was a an amazing interview or conversation. Maybe it was because of the person, maybe it was because of the discussion or where it went, but anything that kind of jumps out as like some of those proudest moments um, and interviews for you. Oh man, what a question. Uh, yeah, I mean, listen, there are so many. So top of mind I can think of is when I was out on set for season 39 of Survivor, uh, you know, I wasn't going to be out for season 40, but I had yeah. this idea of like, let me do, you know, Survivor at 20, which was this series uh, in honor of uh, the 20th anniversary of Survivor that was coming up about, like, interviewing everyone behind the scenes mm -hmm. and trying to find out what they do, what their history is about the show. That is one of the sets of pieces that I, I feel, like, happiest about, not only in how it ended up being constructed at the end of the day, but just being able to find out so, so much about this show that I wondered so much about too, you know, with mm -hmm. the exceptions of things like Caleb's medevac in Co Wrong or like yeah. Jeff greeting the, the camera crew in Survivor 41, there is 
islands teeming with hundreds of international crew members that have been picked up over the past 20 plus years that we rarely think about. And so getting the opportunity to not only get to speak with them, but again, ask those questions I always want asked and, you know, get to satiate that part of my fandom Mm -hmm. was something that I absolutely loved. I mean, certainly there are people that I never thought in my life I would speak with that I've had the opportunity to. I guess most recently I got to talk with freaking Alan Cumming for <laughs> The Traders, which, you know, it's always interesting when people get more and more into reality television, uh, you yeah. know, who you end up talking with. Specifically, like, I think Celebrity Big Brother is a good example, uh-huh. right? Like, considering this, okay, I guess, I, yeah, I guess I will talk with Lamar Odom while he's eating room service bacon <laughs> at, like, 8 a.m. On the, on the West Coast after Celebrity Big Brother. Sure, I'll do it. Because again, yep. uh, you know, take take those opportunities. What I will say is, I I do feel proud of stuff I was able to do in Big Brother twenty four this past season yeah. in particular. Because look, I do not consider myself really a hard hitting journalist by any sense, right? Like you talked you talked about it. I'm fun. I'm goofy, uh, and so that's why it's also really interesting as well as like. I have this almost journalistic side of me, which isn't completely serious, but like I have a job to do. And then I do feel like podcast me is like, let's take off the tie a little bit uh, and let the nipples out. Like let's dress up in stupid (laughs) outfits. Let's make weird jokes. Uh, That feels a little less buttoned up than, uh, than the, the journalistic side. But obviously this past season of big brother, while, you know, sometimes exhilarating, had some accountability that yeah. need to, needed to be had. And so it was a big challenge for me. I, I really had a lot of like internal struggle and I think try to make it my primary thing to hold people accountable, maybe not necessarily for the first time, but again, something like Survivor, something like The Amazing Race is an edited show. There can be so much that can be distilled that again, I'm, I'm very open to having people to say like, okay, how did you really feel about this? Why did you do this? Right. And there were some very hateful personal things that were done this season. Uh, and so it was a pretty wild moment for me when the Big Brother 24 finale yeah. happened. I did interviews. They were running super late. I was up until like three in the morning Oof. writing them up. And I just like passed out. And I woke up to a clip of myself talking with the runner-up, Monty, uh, going viral in just kind of giving off the laundry list of, of things that he had done. Yeah. And that honestly was incredibly fulfilling. And it's odd to say, right, because it's just like, you know, giving, calling someone out for, for their behaviors. But I right. think, again, for me, as someone who didn't necessarily get into it, that way to not be like the Barbara Walters, may she rest in peace, right? The person to really hold someone's feet to the fire. Even still five years later, I'm finding new facets of myself that I am, I'm willing and eager to explore. And I think this past, you know, six months or so being able to feel like, okay, I can ask harder questions. I can make people feel a little more uncomfortable you know, it, it helped me, I think, allay some anxieties of like, oh, no, am I going to ruin the interview? Or are they going to storm off, et cetera, et cetera? I, I felt a lot better about my own set of skills. And that just came with time and, again, opportunities. So I've interviewed, you know, so many great people. Uh, I've got to hear, hear so many great stories. Hell, like I started crying on an amazing race interview I did this past season yeah. just because one team had such an incredible story that they were crying on the interview and it brought me to tears. But I think for my own like tool belt in a manner of speaking, big brother 24, most recently the entire experience, I think helped support my own skills and maybe make me realize that I could do things that I didn't even think was possible when I took this mantle up five years ago. Wow. And I, I, I I love even hearing that um, and that evolution. And what's also interesting is that while you've experienced that, like, and navigate that as yourself, like you make these choices on the podcast. You had a lot of choices that you had to make uh, in relation to Big Brother twenty four. You and um, a bunch of the other people, like uh, Sharon Thorpe, and a bunch of the other people covering it, um, and. 
I, I think what's interesting about that from, from my perspective, I mean, Mike, I admire you so much as mm -hmm. a podcaster, as a person, uh, Thank but you. In, in terms of that, one thing I love is that you showing up in the way that you did, not only being a professional in terms of doing your work and, um, you know, taking it really seriously, but also, you know, holding people's feet to the fire. And, you know, I know someone who calls this like the pushback button, like when there's bullshit, you know, you it, it's important to call it out, not only for the sake of just doing the right thing, but also because there are people who are listening who are thinking, we know what happened. Is Mike going to say the thing or is he going to go and try to keep, you know, maintain a positive relationship with the person on the other end? And, you know, hopefully people appreciate being held accountable and being confronted with the truth. But I, I mentioned that to say, like, I think that you showing up in a way that's pushing back or just, you know, calling out things like they are that deserve to be called out create space for more people to do that like for me to do that for other podcasters to do that for people in their everyday lives to do that when when you know shit comes up you know basically yeah um, no I no I, no i mean that's i'll admit uh i won't use the word confrontational but <laughs> being able to podcast has made yeah. me definitely more sure in my opinions mm -hmm. i mean listen again we can talk about mental health uh there yeah. are definitely moments where i'm still like oh i'm second guessing myself should i have said that do i really believe that but i i do think i am someone who is able to trust my inner voice now and it's come through a number of things therapy medication etc but i think part of it is as we talked about in the very beginning of this being able to to put that voice out there and getting at least some response from it. And also I think respecting the idea that people can disagree and that's okay. Like we're dealing, hell, I host an off-season podcast series with Rob where we rank and rate things that are arbitrary and reductive. Right. And I'll admit the first couple of times when people are like, oh, this list is trash. So-and-so should have been on it. Why was this rated this? It definitely got my head spinning a bit. It makes you second guess yourself as like, okay, are my opinions trash? But you realize that opinions are like assholes. Everyone has one. Yeah. And uh, I'm grateful I had the opportunity to show my asshole to people Whoa. for the past 10 years. There we go. Now it's my opportunity to go full bloom. Uh, and I, uh, it's just, I think, has made me feel like in my real life, I can be... Uh, I can be more sure in my convictions. I am very much a people pleaser yeah. in my real life. Not only just because I'm, you know, sometimes non-confrontational right. and I just want to like smooth things over and move on, be the person that was like, yeah, I'm so sorry. I was wrong. I was wrong. But I think I've learned more and more. And maybe this just comes with maturation and like trying to leave, you know, petty high school-esque drama bullshit behind. But just feeling like, oh, you know, I can stand my ground. A little mm -hmm. bit. I can I can make the argument. And yes, I can be wrong. And I still want to be open to listening to other people, accepting their opinion and changing it. But I can also formulate my own opinion and my own POV and not automatically think that it's the wrong one, which was my MO for probably at least 25 years. Wow. Yeah. Whoa. It's 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 deep and there's and it's it's only getting deeper. Um and, you know, I, I think that part of that that's fascinating to me is just recognizing how, you know, feedback is something that all, well, that everyone has to deal with in yeah. different, different ways, right? Not just in terms of podcasts, but, you know, life. And I am really curious, um, as we dive more and more into the mental health journey, like, how has your relationship with feedback evolved from 2017 when you were about three years into podcasting with rhap to <laughs> now uh nearly 10 years into... oh good the truth uh, one yeah. foot at the grave yeah it's so it's definitely evolved i will say therapy has has helped me a lot with it uh and mm -hmm. what i really recommend I, I think i talked about this with Taryn, but i'll again state it is I feel like everybody out there should at least try once to speak with a therapist, even even if you don't think there's like anything particular you want to talk about. Because for me, there is so much value in talking with somebody who maybe is not an objective voice, but is mm -hmm. a voice removed from your daily life. 
Yeah. Because I feel like, you know, when you if you're able to talk with your partner, with your family, with your close friends about stuff, that's all well and good. But I do feel like sometimes your thoughts about their feedback can be colored by your relationship with mm-hmm. them. Mm-hmm. This sort of removes that aspect. And, you know, uh, I believe when I was talking with Tara and I had just started really journeying on my mental health it, because, you know, I had sort of, again, as I talked about before, not realizing that, you know, th- the way I think isn't normal. It, uh, it, it really sent me on this journey. I don't think I've ever talked about this, uh, which is wild because, again, I've talked about literally everything under the yes. sun. So we, we all have that, like, one or two celebrity deaths that, like, shake us to our core, right? Like, Matt, what's, what's yours? Oh, you my know? God. <laughs> my head imme- immediately went to pro wrestling uh, growing up. So there's, like, you know, Eddie Guerrero was a wrestler mm. who died suddenly. He was wrestling for the championship schedule to do it on a Sunday, died of heart failure, I think, on, like, the Friday. I remember mm. where I was. I remember where I was when Michael Jackson died, a few yeah. other ru- – a bunch of other um, people. So, yeah, they're, they're, I, I feel that, Mike. What, what's, what's that been like for, for you? Yeah, so for me, the one that really, quite honestly, like, changed the path of my life was Robin Williams. I had uh, a feeling that's what you're going to say. Yeah, so he was – without even realizing it like someone i really gravitated towards not only because listen i was a kid of the 90s and so i'm like oh it's the genie it's mrs doubtfire it's you know peter from jumanji etc etc yeah but i think the more i thought about it you know posthumously in a manner of speaking the more i realized probably unconsciously i was watching this guy right who was doing stand-up and just like going a mile a minute and i realized oh there is someone who thinks the same way as me yeah. Right, whose brain is constantly working, not even thinking about the last topic and just jumping over to the other things, constantly talking, loud voices, stupid, silly impressions, et cetera, et cetera. And it's something that I, I really gravitated towards. I, like a lot of the world, was shocked when he died by suicide. And yeah. it turned out that he had this history of uh you know anxiety and of depression that got him to a point where he he felt like he can no longer take it and i i sat there for a while with myself after i'd heard the news uh and i i just sort of thought like because again i wasn't seeing therapy i was just you know uh, with my own thoughts uh and i i was thinking yeah it's, it's just it's so odd that like someone who is so funny and so quick-witted and you know someone who uh likes to put a lot of positivity out there it's so odd that they they get in their own head and they hate themselves and they're sad and sometimes they just get so overwhelmed that they can't take it anymore yeah and then i stopped and i said oh that's me wow oh okay and it really like it shocked me because again i I had assumed that right. people have had ev- that everyone had thought about killing themselves. To be honest, I I'd mm-hmm. assumed that everyone had that voice in their head calling them a piece of crap and beating themselves up for every tiny mistake that they had made. And I think seeing like the shock mm-hmm. communally behind his death made me realize that wasn't normal. Yeah. And so when it comes to the therapy side of things, one of the first things that we really worked on was trying to gain that sense of confidence, to gain that sense of like self-satisfaction and not have to feel like just because someone else is saying something that their opinion matters more than yours. And that's a little mm-hmm. egocentric, but like definitely on the same level. And then I, yeah. again, my mind is open to people changing my mind with the great opinions that they bring in there, but it shouldn't automatically be in the level of like, oh yes, yes, I'm so sorry. Yes, of course you're right and I'm wrong. Uh, trying to make it a little bit more even keeled in that way. And it's it's also really interesting to gain the larger perspective of things. I am so so happy whenever i get to go to a live show for a number of reasons not only is there like really fun kinetic energy in the room and getting to right. see a live show is just so great again as a theater kid i just loved getting to experience like the energy of an audience but at the same time those of you that are able to approach myself or any of the podcasters at these events and like talk about how you enjoy the content we make 
you have no idea how much this means to us. Because just as an example, like let's say 10 people listen to your podcast or watch right. your video or what have you. S six of them will just say, okay, that was good. I like that. And then just move on move with on. their lives. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd say maybe one or two will, will send out something and be like, oh, that was fun. They'll post something on social media. They'll tag you. They'll say, oh yeah, that was really fun. I enjoyed that part. Everyone else will then be the ones to say, no, I disagree. Didn't like that. Why is it sounding like this? Yeah. Et cetera, et cetera. And so when your perspective is only really taking in those two or three people, it can be understandable why you narrow your worldview to assume, well, if the only comments I'm receiving about this thing are that it's not good or that my voice is annoying or that, you know, I, yep. I've made this mistake that it then is, okay, that's the general assumption about everything. When there really is such a wide swath of people that, again, we don't think about. That yeah. when I actually get to meet people and hear about how much they, they enjoy all the stuff we get to do, it really serves as a great reminder that social media is not real life in many, no. many ways. And I think that's a good example. I mean, listen, go to Yelp reviews of restaurants and, and other places, <laughs> right? Like the vast majority of the time, right. the, the reviews are negative. It's people being so spurred on by a negative experience that they had that they're uh -huh. going to go on and review. Barely anyone has a good experience with a with a venue and is like, I think I'll go on Google reviews and leave a nice five star thing. Uh -huh. So I think that has really helped open help open up my eyes is that certainly, you know, there are people out there that offer constructive criticism or even disagree with things, but they are not the end all be all. Uh, and I yeah. think that has very greatly helped my own digestion of feedback. Yeah, and there's there's so much um, within what you said uh, that we'll touch on and go back to. But even just uh, with what you said about that feedback, I've it, one thing that's so fascinating to me, um, and that's been really powerful about Pod Friends. Thankfully, is like a lot of people have reached out with their reactions, or you know how they've digested different conversations and episodes that jump out to them. And, and I love that. And it, one thing that's also interesting, though, is that when I go to different live events time and time again, I'll hear from somebody who's like, I listen to Pod Friends. I love what you're doing with Pod Friends. And I'm like, could you please like, uh, like, tweet me that comment that tell me that because the other aspect of it too is like, and um, we I feel like this comes up so often on different podcast and like we know pe people obviously are listening but also like sometimes it doesn't feel like anyone's listening um even when you get that feedback or like it's the 10 friends as opposed to like the thousand friends who are mm -hmm. actually tuning mm -hmm. in and so one thing i i like to do is to encourage people like let the podcasters and the podcasts and even just more broadly let the people you know that you appreciate that you appreciate them because um i mean there's there's definitely the mental health aspect but even just on a higher level there's the aspect of like well i guess i should just spend my time doing something else because it's not you know as receptive and so i tell people like and i say this a lot with pod friends i'm like if you love it let me know let's yeah. keep it going because there's because obvious i mean honestly there's so many other things going on in the world and it's like uh i'm i'm thankful that i keep doing this i'm very thankful for the place to to do this i'm thankful that you have that space to keep going um even when you haven't always received that uh you know the positivity or the the hey mike we all 99 of us love you you know yeah and that's something that can be really tough to digest sometimes so even like checking back in with my own mental health journey from mm -hmm. yeah. five years ago it has definitely gotten better you know i i invested in therapy which worked for me again it may not work for everybody but i valued so much having someone like from outside of the community outside of really being associated with anything i do podcast and interview wise to like talk with me about my own confidence issues about trying to build up my own skill set as well as just like how I believe in myself. I've also been, you know, on medications for about five years. That is that has mm. really helped, I think, even out the high highs in a manner of speaking. But yeah, it, there are moments, you know, uh mental health, anxiety, depression, they're not exactly akin to chronic illnesses, but like they don't go away. Yeah. Um they are things that have you take dips and and hit 
very high highs. And I'll, I'll give you a very, yeah. very recent example. Uh, so again, like I had been doing fairly well. I feel like my my life, everything is is in a place where I want it to be. December 30th and December 31st, it was just a couple of days from hell. Uh, it was just like bad thing piling up upon bad thing. Truly like some of the most Murphy's Law stuff that I had experienced. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was making mistakes. There were circumstances outside of my control that was happening. They just felt like, you know, everything was kind of collapsing down around me. And at a couple points, I thought to myself, this would all be so much easier if I was dead. This would be a way to just wipe things clean and move on and not have yeah. to worry and not have to feel anything. And it's like akin to yeah. walking to the edge of a building and like pulling yourself back and like that, that feeling of like not adrenaline, but like yeah. exhilaration of being like, Oh my God, I, 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 I cannot believe that I thought that. And so uh, it's it was a, a really tough reminder for me that the work never ends when it comes to mental health, that you can find coping mechanisms, that you can find things to help you be able to get through your day, to get you through tough moments. But there will be some times when you want to follow in the footsteps of Robin Williams yeah, to, to the end of things. And it was... God, it was scary. It was, mm -hmm. it was really scary. And so, yeah. I just, I, I, I think for me, I, I didn't get a sense as to like the the things that were beyond me. I think in those moments, you get so fixated on yourself and and what's going on with you and how you're feeling, and you forget so much about the things that you bring and not even, you know, being like a podcaster interview, et cetera, but yeah. like the things you, you bring to your friends, to your loved ones, to your, your family, you know, that, that all goes away when you catastrophize and you, you clothe things in. So let me, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll put something out there for anyone out there, because again, as, as I experience, I'm sure there are people out there who sometimes experience the same thoughts Definitely. as as I do uh who not even to the level of of self harm or anything like that but certainly feel like sometimes the world can get so burdensome that they just they just want to you know they just want to be done with it what i will say is that you matter so much more than you would ever think it, it's almost like uh well you know i'm just one light in an entire electrical grid. You know, if, if I went out, nothing would happen. But if you turn those lights out, the world's going to shine a little less brightly without you in it. And I don't think you, you realize the impact you have on the people in your life. And just, just you know, take care of yourself and make sure you know that you, you do matter. We all Hello. do. Uh, that's something that I think needs to be said a lot, whether due to feedback, like you said, or just trying to, to make sure that you don't make a very hasty and deadly decision. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think I wish it's, it's something that I need to keep reminding myself. And it's something I, I want to tell people out there too, uh, who are not afforded the same platform as me. I, I hope that someone out there is, is able to, to pocket that and remember it for a time where days might be darker. The sun is going to peek through no matter yeah. what, unless you're living in like the Pacific Northwest. Cause that doesn't have a lot of sunshine. I hear <laughs> Mike, just, you, you, you didn't have to end on the, and you know, and especially when like you get the emotions going and uh, like, I would, if, if we weren't recording this right now on a video podcast, I'd probably be crying a, a lot more, but um, no, it's um, yeah. It, and one, I have to thank you for just sharing all that. And um, it's, 
you know, it's powerful because one of the things that's resonated with me most about you has been you opening up and speaking about your mental health. And I think the, uh, I don't know if it's like funny coincidence, uh, but I want to say it was like the t- maybe it was two times we recorded a podcast or something mm-hmm. that I just happened to listen to Lost Down the Hatch before I started to listen to a little bit more. And both times you were like opening up so deeply about your mental health and about like suicide and everything else and it really hit me and um it it was powerful because for me personally like i've i i feel like there's a gut check of like how is your mental health doing you where are you and i've been thankful to like not be at the point of like you know take my own life or not wanting to but also at the same time i think something that i still struggle with is like not um you know, having moments where I'm like, oh, these people don't care to have me, you know, there or show up or support them as much as, you know, people care and it matters, you know. And and I even was thinking about this this past weekend with a few friends where I was like, I'm tired, so I'm going to just take my space and my energy, but also realizing like, you know, it does matter when you're not there sometimes for people or when you're not able to show up. And then rest is important and all that. But yeah, I, I say that to say it was a moment where I was really pausing to and actually like journaling a little bit too to like process. And I'm a big fan of therapy, um, like you said, on top of all this, but like processing, like, you know, so many of us um, don't feel like we're like the space that we take up matters or that it matters to the level that it does. And one of the things that I'm always so amazed by, and I'm so thankful that I've kind of seen this as a theme is that, you know, I interview all these people out for pod friends, but outside of pod friends for work. And I'm talking with all these people mainly like people of color and interviewing them about their work and their lives and their careers. And I'm always telling them like, you are a superhero in what you're doing. And I could say that for you too, Mike, like you are genuinely, but you're genuinely a superhero in so many ways to so many people and what we've talked about. And it, the thing that like fucking sucks, honestly, is that, and I had this moment where I realized this, where, I could see this and point to this for so many people, but then to look in the mirror and be like, Matt, you're a superhero. You're a badass, like is so much harder to do. And I don't know why life and our brains are like that. I I'm sure that that's common. Yeah. Oh, incredibly so. And that's, that's what I've been really trying to work on is I have the opportunity and we Mm -hmm. all do to afford so much grace onto other people, right? Like if we're approached by somebody and somebody's arguing with us, we're like, oh, maybe they had a bad day. Okay, it makes sense why they're feeling this way. Again, maybe that's my more empathetic nature. But there's this disconnect where it's like, but why do I hold myself to a higher standard Mm -hmm. than I do others? That is bullshit, to be completely honest. And it's still like a, a break that I am trying to work on. But I completely agree with you there. It is so tough that for whatever reason, we tend to be like, we must be the perfect human because we study others and we we try to do what they don't do. Yeah, We're humans at the end of the day. We all have the same types of blood. Well, quite literally not, uh, you know, different types of blood, but the same (laughs) blood pumping through us. We still have, we we have the same organs with the same brain makeup Uh in a manner of speaking. Like what's, what's to, to, prevent us from making mistakes as well it just it's it's tough to be more forgiving of yourself but it is essential um because otherwise you know that was me for the first again like 25 years of my life was being incredibly high stakes feeling like everything was a matter of life or death Mm -hmm. which is what led me on you know several occasions to having those ideations to to having those types of thoughts is like okay i did this thing i didn't do it the way i wanted to therefore i should die uh yeah. it, it really is putting those stakes behind every single thing that happened and i've definitely helped chip away at that mentality a little bit more again it's not completely gone right. to your point but yeah it is just this like really tough hypocrisy is a weird way to put it but it kind of is right this idea of being able to allow others to be flawed, but mm-hmm. not to allow yourself to be flawed. Well, I mean, and I think a big part of that too is like being in your head and in your own shoes. Like it's so yeah. much harder to be 
it's so much harder to one give yourself grace but I'll, it's also so much hard to like see yourself as the amazing person that others see because there's all of the processing like there's all the decisions and the considerations and like everything that's not even outside of you or external that you're dealing with and i think like i i just wish that i mean myself included that more people had that positive just had those reminders of how amazing they are because like mike i, I mean if if you were no longer with us i would be fucked up and like that's saying i mean that's i mean i don't well i was gonna say that's saying a lot but like thinking of all the people who are even closer to you like it there's there's it goes without saying um you know and i i appreciate having this like real conversation with you and um i just have so much love for you opening up yourself in a way that is like that people need and that we don't do and i think like this is kind of weirdly back to like the big brother conversation mm -hmm. but like you opening up and being vulnerable and like just being human and real and like this is what i experienced like that makes it so that like the next conversation i go into i could do that that makes it so like the next conversations that the millions of listeners the pod friends go into that they're able to do that too and so i don't know i just i yeah. i'm i'm grateful for grateful for that thank you yeah uh yeah thank you a lot for that that <laughs> is that was that was unexpected but again very much needed tell people you love them folks uh, either from like your your favorite content creator or just your your friends because you um you don't know how much i needed to hear that the past week or so when i was at my worst um yeah i i yeah. think that it's something and i'll admit like uh i would not keep talking about this type of stuff were it not for when i first talked about it because i feel like the terran show was really the first opportunity that i really had to talk about it because again i was very much like people just want to hear this recaps of the shows they don't want to hear about me but also it was the first time i was really exploring those aspects right through therapy yeah. and through medication that i you know, had talked about it for the first time. And I, I really have to commend those that were able to reach out to me after the fact. And honestly, every time that I've, I've really gone in depth about my mental health, including down the hatch, not to spoil too much of Lost, but you should yeah. watch Lost, uh, is that, you know, there were yeah. several times, uh, one particular instance is that there is a character who at one point does try to die by suicide. And it allowed me to, I think, expose a part of myself that was very raw that I didn't even realize at the time because I had not watched that moment since I had started really deep diving into my mental health and where all of my issues come from. And so it allowed me this opportunity to be very open in a way that I had not before. Obviously, I'm a very open person just in terms of like letting my goofiness out. You know, I... To say I'm one to commit to the bit is an understatement, uh, <laughs> just in how much I'm I'm willing to like do stupid things uh, for the sake of hopefully making people feel a little bit better about their day. And every time I was able to to really open up about myself, it was so nerve wracking, not even from the ability of like, oh, I'm getting to two dark subjects, but just like being like, does anyone really care? Like, yeah. is this make, being too, you know, self-centric? But I received a, a good bevy of, of comments every single time I talk about it, about like, thank you for doing this. I, I did not realize you were, you were hurting so much. And I think, yeah, I think that's the thing that, that I want people to take away as well is like, don't walk around and assume that everyone is, you know, uh, feeling this way. But I do think again, going back to Robin Williams, the way that the reason why he, his death, I mean, look at, recently someone like twitch may he rest in peace right like you mm -hmm. never know what someone is thinking and in fact comedians those that make us laugh the most are, are doing so to i think mask things that they may be feeling totally. too uh and it's it's something that took me a little while to figure out both about you know the people the celebrities we love and ourselves and so you know you use it as a as an opportunity to maybe realize perhaps your own state of things uh, i'm not saying like yeah. unpack all the the anxieties you may have but what i would also suggest is you know if, if you don't like something try to change it 
I think that's also something that I, I've really taken away from myself the past couple of years is like mm -hmm. having the initiative. Again, it took me a while to get into a lot of the coping mechanisms that I use now, but like the most important and hardest step to take is by far the first one, uh, just because it's a lot to both find the resources, but also to give yourself that energy to actually move ahead with it. And I remember after I had these these very depressive episodes, you know, about a week or so ago, I was able to come out of it with a list of like actionable items. And I'm a problem solver by nature. That's what makes me happy is being like, OK, let's figure this out. Let's unpack this together. And it brought me so much joy to be able to walk out of that experience and be like, OK, if you're feeling this way, these are things we should try to yeah. help with that. It made me feel much less hopeless about the entire thing, right? Feeling like I'm, I'm mired, uh, that I am just like lying adrift in this ocean in a manner of speaking with no sense of land in sight. It's like, OK, well, the first thing you should do is start paddling. The more yeah. you float there the less likely you're going to see land anytime soon. But if you start paddling, you might end up going in the wrong direction, but at least you're making an effort to, to go in some direction. And so that's yeah. what I think has, has brought me a lot of satisfaction uh, personally. Again, I'm not speaking on behalf of everyone's experience is like, you know, if you are not happy with your lot in life, if you, if you're afforded the resources and the opportunities, be able to find those, those things and try to take the initiative to actually change them because nobody can make those changes but you yeah yeah that's that's real and i i want to ask because you referenced it and i think people would benefit from it too but like what are could you talk about like some of those like coping mechanisms or things that you kind of turn to whatever that is that mm -hmm. kind of helps because I'm I'm sure that there are people who this definitely deeply resonates with or maybe people who haven't even thought about this because we move so fast at times where it's like well I haven't even like fully checked in with myself about how I'm doing with my mental health but like how do you cope and kind of navigate um I, I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure it's a, a lot of work obviously yeah. um but what what does that actually like look like more tangibly yeah, so obviously different for everybody. For me, yeah. uh, I am very single-minded. I have a very tough time multitasking just right. in general. Again, ask my wife. Uh, and so I, I'm able to benefit from that, almost use your weakness as a superpower in that mm -hmm. way, in that one of my best coping mechanisms is dissociation. Mm. Uh, if an invasive thought takes over my brain, I'm just like, okay, let me put on something to watch, let me play something. Let me focus on something else. Yeah. And for me, because I'm a dumb dumb who can't keep two thoughts in his head at the same time. You are you are not a dumb dumb, Mike. Oh, um, thank but you. I get it. I, I I could barely keep one thought in my head. So yeah, exactly. You sympathize. So like, it, <laughs> it allows it to like almost force that other thought out to be like, okay, yeah. let me concentrate on this other thing. I mean. I am like an out and out workaholic. Uh, I, I, if it's not become clear, uh, you know, p people ask me all the time, like, how are you able to do all the things that you do? And aside from, again, the resources that I have been granted, I love doing it. I love being busy. I value my free time as well, obviously, mm -hmm. but like, I love being able to do so many things. I don't know how Rob is able, able to came, uh, able to cover the same survivor episode, like six or seven times in no one clue. week. <laughs> What happens with me that I really value is like every podcast I do usually in a week is like covering a different show, which mm -hmm. I think helps keep things fresh and new for me, but then also helps keep my brain focused on that type of stuff and, and less so on, you know, the other types of things that may come in. So that's really like the main thing for me. Of course, there are sort of mantras, you know, I'm a big believer in that and my therapist sent me mantras that like I would say to myself and you think it's silly right initially when you do it, but the more you say it, it's like the Meisner yeah. technique, like the more you actually say it, the more of an impact it makes and the more it eventually does permeate that brain yeah. and actually get in your head. I've also, you know, gotten lucky in many ways, in many ways, in that uh, I have, I mean, I, ha I have a son uh, yeah. who I think takes a lot of attention away from me which is it sounds like a slight but it's not in this case right it's like okay i have something that i need to concentrate on it also really helps me contextualize everything yeah. right that like 
I could be worried about a comment on social media or like something I said on a podcast or a message that I received. But all of that is small potatoes compared to like a child that I am responsible for the well-being. Mm -hmm. um, and so it does help me, I think, put things into perspective of, yes, these things can certainly get you worried sometimes and the work still matters. But there also are larger things that matter, too. Uh, and that has really shifted my perspective. I mean, I am by no means, like, estranged from my family or, like, have bad blood. But, like, I am, am not really someone who communicates with my immediate family on, like, a huge basis. We'll do holidays and everything like that. But I think, right. by and large, I'm just a very independent person. Maybe it's just because I, I do so many things. But being able to then have my own sort of family that I engage with mm -hmm. like it's so it's rough to say because again like this is this is no offense to like my my immediate family but like now I understand what they say when they mean family comes first like now I do yeah being able to form my own family uh and now and there's also found family and you know friends and everything like that it doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. need to be blood relatives but I think it has given me so much perspective for that that there will be moments when I'll be, you know, drawn away from thinking about work to doing something with Asher, whether playing with him, taking care of him, you know, tending to his needs, etc. Yeah. And then I'll actually look back and I'll be like, yeah, you know what? Like in retrospect, why am I focusing so much on this? Like this is an actual living, breathing human mm -hmm. that I am taking care of. That should bear so much more weight than something a troll said to me. Well, yeah, and and I think just kind of reflecting on what you've shared, and again, I really appreciate like just this conversation, is that one of the things that I've found um, so helpful for me, just in in my mental health journey in my life, has been just being really mindful of like what you're consuming, which is tough mm -hmm. when you're like constantly consuming sh different shows and podcasts. And then, you know, it, it, there's, there could be a lot there. And I think being paying attention to the emotions that come out of those things. I mean, I have had this epiphany in the last couple of years, specifically in relation to pro wrestling and music, because um, I am the weird person who, like, in my Spotify wrapped, I have, like, WWE, pro wrestling is, like, one of the top. And granted, like, they, there's a ton of theme songs by different artists. Under do they their, release and, the theme song? Does, like, is John do. Cena's theme song on yes. Spotify? Yes, multiple John Cena theme songs over the years are on Spotify, Mike. Huh. But I think what's interesting is that when I was a kid, I was a wrestling fan. I loved listening to you know, a lot of those songs are different music, even by mainstream artists that would um, play in those contexts or just music in general. And I realized, like, I feel like listening to this music that was really like high energy, motivational, like I could do this. I'm a badass kick. I don't know if it's like kicking ass, take names, but it was like that type of thing. Like, you know, I could, I could do it was um, something that I feel like has kind of motivated my mindset into that place of like, yeah, I could do it. Like in in the moment, like imagine like going down the ramp, Mike, with your theme song, with your wrestling character. Like I'm a badass. The crowd's cheering. Like that kind of thing helps. And then I also had a realization, and not and we're not going to go into talking about Taylor Swift. I will not knock Taylor Swift. I will say, yeah, don't make that mistake, dude. <laughs> yeah, it's like. <laughs> Don't be like, what's his name? Cody from uh, Peloton, right? Didn't he get in trouble for knocking Taylor Swift, I think? <laughs> Probably. Um, but I was going to say, Taylor Swift released her album this year. Beyonce also released an album this year. And I compare these two because with Beyonce's album, Renaissance, it was all, you know, it, it was all very much like, I'm that girl. Like, that's literally her first song. She's very much about, like, I am Beyonce I am mm -hmm. capable and I feel like listening to that album like so many people Aman shout out to Aman who I know is probably listening oh, to it in this Aman. exact moment uh but you know that motivation I realize has been so important to me and then I realized with Taylor Swift in contrast and this is by no means exclusive to these two artists but I listened to that I'm like damn I feel like I, I just broke up with someone I feel like upset and so I just being mindful of what you consume I think is important and yeah. even if it's just like the songs um but you know the other thing you you start to talk about fatherhood a little bit and mm -hmm. that is the big change from 2017 to to now Mike and I guess I I, I mean 
I, I don't know where to start as a non dad. Uh, what? 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 What is a good question? Uh, first off, let me just dote back on the point that you made. Oh, please. I, no, because I totally agree about how sometimes I talk about dissociation, but sometimes yeah. we can be affected by the stuff that will take in. I'll give an example. I think, you know, part of the, those no good, terrible, very bad days that I had a couple of weeks ago. So I got to go see A Strange Loop, uh, which, you know, is closing this coming weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, Best musical winner, Pulitzer Prize winner. And it was a really fantastic show and asked a lot of questions. But the show ends with the character in like a very lonely, very isolated state. It was all yeah. about this this guy trying to navigate the world as like a, a fat, black, queer man and trying to figure oh, out like where exactly God. he fits in. And it was tear jerking. And at the same time, having gone into it in almost like the mood that I was, it really had me ruminate. And I would not say like, oh, Strange Loop, you put me in a worse place. But I think it did have me like, empathizing and sympathizing i am like a very empathetic person which works yeah. both for and against me for i think i'm able to again have conversations with people totally be in an interviews around my own life and like feel their pain here it can be tough to like watch something sad and like not have that live in my head mm -hmm. for a good 24 hours and so i i completely agree with you that i think just watch the stuff Watch the stuff you're watching is odd, an odd sentence, but I think it's very pertinent. As an example, yeah. um, so Station Eleven was this like HBO Max series that's apparently, you know, incredibly well done, but it does take place like post pandemic. And I recall at the beginning of last year, you know, uh, people were checking it out, recommending it to me. I had so seen sort of what it was about. And I think given my own anxieties about the pandemic still, mm -hmm. I was very much like, this would not put me in a good headspace. I do not think I would enjoy it as much. And also it would probably reflect badly on me. Let me wait until I'm in a better spot. Same thing with something like The Bear, which I know is yeah. very acclaimed, the Hulu uh, cooking show. But I also know it is very anxiety inducing. Mm -hmm. And I've talked several times on on shows about how like, I don't like horror movies. I don't like, yes, there is that adrenaline rush, but I do not like things that make me feel dread, that make me feel anxiety, just because, again, that's something that's going to map onto me and something that will probably linger with me longer than the typical person. So, yeah, I, yeah, I would absolutely recommend that to people is like figure out sort of what triggers is a, is a, is a weighted word in that way. But like what makes you feel a certain way? And if you're in a certain mood, you know, do not pursue things that'll probably push that along. Yeah. Now let's move along to fatherhood because that's also <laughs> sort of like, well, it's actually, it's it's not too dissimilar. Interesting. Because I mean, I'll be open. It's been a struggle. Um, yeah. It's it's been a beautiful struggle because it is constantly trying to solve a puzzle, but the puzzle changes about every six months or so yeah. just when you think you've got the last piece in place then the p pieces fly everywhere and mm -hmm. there's an entire new shape to mm -hmm. sort out it's a it's an incredible thing to watch someone grow like i i it allows you to almost re-examine the human condition watching someone like learn to walk learn to talk learn all these things about the world i never think i'd have to describe like what a leaf was to somebody because you just take so much for granted because you're not liaising yeah. with those types of people in your day to day um, but you know, it has given me, it has given me opportunities to, I think, explore sides of myself that had been pushed to the limit. Mm -hmm. Uh, namely, I think, I think my, my anger is something that, uh, I did not expect to have to sort of reckon with and, you know, probably raises a few eyebrows yourself included because, I obviously come across as not a, a very angry person. Usually, yeah. again, I'm, I'm very happy-go-lucky. Uh, and I've even talked about moments where I've been, you know, sad-go-unlucky, I suppose, is the opposite of it. Um, right. But if I am pushed, I, I, can, I can be pushed. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think as a child, especially as a toddler, they say terrible twos, but three major is certainly more important, uh, appropriate. Yeah. As, as you're sort of pushed to your limits it causes you to not obviously like strike out at someone, but I think just like really boil inside yourself. And so mm -hmm. I found, you know, my own sort of coping mechanisms to deal with that, to channel it 
in a matter of speaking. Uh, this is going to surprise a lot of people, but the past six, past six months, I've taken up kickboxing. I've taken Ooh. up, uh, yeah, some martial arts as just a way to like channel anything I might be feeling in an efficient way. Is a matter of speaking. I also took it up because, uh, you know, in the summer, I was feeling really trepidatious and nervous about just the state of the world. Not to say that anything is like markedly improved, but like certainly had a sense of helplessness and fearlessness. And again, to what I mentioned before, okay, let's solve the problem. Let's create actionable items. Yeah. I wanted a way to feel like I could defend myself, a way that I could defend my family. And so I've, I've been trying to find ways to be less angry and be more patient. And again, that's that's not to say like besmirching the entire parenthood process. It is totally awesome. And I love Asher at this age as well, because like I feel like I can engage with him, play with him, have conversations with him, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But it ain't all roses and you know, pixie no. dust that the Instagram pics depict everybody. There is a lot of havoc that goes on behind the scenes, and mm -hmm. it's it's been a struggle. But I, I'm so grateful to have a partner like Angela, first off, to yeah. allow me to, to do the things that I get to do. But then also, like, I think our relationship has grown even stronger. We were very strong to begin with, but even stronger from having a child, because I think we've been much more communicative. Uh, we haven't allowed ourselves to stew in like, OK, I saw you doing this. Uh, we're, we've allowed ourselves to be more patient with each other. And I think it's just again, that problem solving thing, we see something's happening with our son or the way one of us is reacting to it. How are we going to deal with that? And I think we've both been very good in allowing ourselves those coping mechanisms as well. So it's even been, I think, a big learning process, I would say the past six months, because when he was a baby, obviously, you know, we were tired, but it was so much wide eyed wonder of like, oh my God, he's doing this for the first time. This is right. cool. Now that we've sort of settled into him becoming a person, it's great. But at the same time, I think like we're now engaging with things like testing our own patience again, our, our own sort of rage for lack of a better term. Yeah. And now trying to find ways for us to kind of be able to cope in, in lieu of all that stuff. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting. Cause well now, so I have a four year old nephew who is def definitely very much like a teenager nowadays, mm -hmm. which is like, where did that come from? How did that happen? And then I also have a, a five or six, six month old nephew. Um, yeah. Six month old nephew. And what's interesting is you, you talked about being pushed, but literally I was visiting family for the holidays crouched down at one point and my four-year-old nephew literally came around, walked in front of me, shoved me to the ground. Like, I Damn. could not, like, legitimately. He did. And he was just, like, unapologetic. And he's like, you're not my friend. And I'm like, bro, yeah. come on. And you have to kind of, I think that it's, it's interesting to navigate. I mean, I can't even... Oh, I was gonna say I can't even imagine as a parent, but I can imagine I can't imagine navigating as a as a parent uh, without just like working on yourself and figuring a lot of that out. Um, yeah, and there's a lot there, but yes, these kids scare me. They, they scare can be, me. No, they can be assholes. I mean, yeah. that's what to say. Kids can be assholes sometimes <laughs> totally. because they are unencumbered. Uh, yeah. They might have etiquette towards other people, but when it comes to parents, uh -huh. the gloves are off sometimes and yeah. in in quite literally shoving people. Uh -huh. I think what parenthood has allowed me to do, and this is something I've only been recently again reckoning with, is, as we talked about before, being more forgiving of yourself. This I, I have an easier time with perhaps than the looking in the mirror stuff that we spoke mm. about earlier. Uh, is that like, I mm. am when in the past when I've like, gotten angry or i've lost my patience with with asher or with the situation like i would then beat myself up about it because i am I just have this image of like no i'm supposed to be this picture perfect father who never yeah. loses his temper who ne never you know uh never has a bad day etc cetera, etc cetera. but i think what has really helped me is just like it's just repeating these ideas of like you're trying mm -hmm. you know and trying is so much of the work. I talk about taking that first step. You know, it's it's been a lot of flying blind. If I may, yeah. again, shed uh, some light upon, you know, my own family situation. My father did a lot of travel, a lot of work growing up. And so mm. when I became a dad, I was nervous for many reasons. But one of them is I 
didn't really have anything to base it off of, if I'm being honest. Uh, yeah. It wasn't like, okay, I'm going to do these things because my dad did it with them or there's this other dad in my life. Yeah, I, I, I kind of grew up without that. Uh, and so it was very much me trying to figure out like, okay, how do I be a father then? What does fathering mean? And also, but how much do I allow him to be his own person versus like how much am I just imparting what happened to me onto him? Because I know yeah. that certainly can become a thing as well, right? We talk about like not generational trauma. I wouldn't call anything uh, that I experienced trauma, but certainly right. the idea of like, well, my dad did it. So therefore I'll do it to you. Yeah. Obviously how going down the ladder uh, may not be great if the roof itself is patchy. So mm -hmm. I, I think that it's it's been a lot of my own sense of figuring out like, who am I as a father? But again, it's this matter of the fact that I'm even considering that makes me, I think, you know, at least qualify for being an okay dad, in my opinion, because there are people out there right. who, you know, just don't really think about their children or just like put themselves on autopilot that are that are incredibly focused on themselves. And I like to give myself some leeway that, yes, sometimes I may have bad days that, yes, sometimes I, I may have, you know, anger or, uh, you know, resentment or sadness towards what's happening with my child. At the same time, I need to remember that these thoughts are fleeting, that I do have this unabashed love for this guy. And then also at the same time that the fact that I am acknowledging these feelings and saying, OK, we're not going to do that next time. We're going to work to do better. Like that can be such leaps and bounds. Yeah. Uh, and what I will compare it to is a show that I have become very well acquainted with in Raising a Toddler, which is a show called Bluey. I'm not sure if you're aware <laughs> no, of that. No, really? Not okay. So Bluey no. is an Australian uh, kids TV show. It is incredible, by the way. But it, it may down. be, to completely honest, like I, I haven't read a lot of parenting books. It may be like the best source of parenting wow. I've, I've ever watched. Um, wow. Because obviously, like it's a show meant for kids, but it largely takes place around a family of four, two daughters, a mom, and a dad. And there are so many like lessons in there for the parents. Oftentimes, like the, the kids go on a journey through an episode and the parents do as well. Like they learn something, mm. they sort of uh, overcome their own issues sometimes. And that's really something that I have personally gleaned. So to go a bit tangential, there is there are these two characters, both dads, two brothers. Mm -hmm. One's named Bandit and one is named Stripe. Uh, Bandit is like <laughs> the perfect ideal dad in a manner of speaking uh they're all dogs that's why they're uh, they have oh, like dog names that should, it should probably was, start with the fact that they're all that, dogs yeah i was gonna say this is an interesting family uh but yeah those australians they got weird names that's hey. just uh but bandit is like the the dad that i think we all strive to be on behalf yeah. of all parents who watch bluey he uh plays with his kids is kind uh, most of the time, like has the right things to say, is incredibly loving and devoted to his family at all times. Stripe is sort of personified as like this guy who has it a little less together. Uh, he's constantly like making mistakes. Uh, you know, he is raising a toddler who is far from easy. And so, yeah. you know, he's having a tough time dealing with that, sometimes distracted, sometimes portrayed as, as a bit of an oaf, someone who's unaware. And so I think, you know, I have always strived to be that that bandit again, that sort of like ideal. But I realized that like in the initial stages, I am much more of a stripe because mm -hmm. stripe has bandit has children that are like six and four. He's been through it. He knows what the routine is. And even though he's discovering new things every day, like he's got a general handle on mm -hmm. who his kids are and how to handle things. Stripe has kids that are like three and one. So he is still very new to it. He's right. still trying to figure it out. And so I think he is more prone to making mistakes just from experience. That's another thing to realize as well. When I, in terms of me forgiving myself for some of the, you know, some of the moments I may have is like, this is my first time doing yeah. things. You yeah. don't step onto a job for the first time and like immediately blame yourself for the quote unquote rookie mistakes that you make. Why should this be any different? And so I think like I found myself almost sympathizing with this character of Stripe more and more that, yeah, sometimes he may be portrayed as as the butt of the jokes. But at the same yeah. time, I think he's an incredibly realistic glimpse into parenting and how 
you know, new parents might get distracted, how new parents are trying to figure out how much of my energy do I dedicate to my child versus myself? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's always a, a constant struggle and it is not always clean, clean and sanitary, quite literally in the case of just how messy Whoa. these kids get. But I would just say also in terms of like, not always getting it right. And it's odd to find, again, those sources through uh, a kid's cartoon with, with talking dogs. But at the same time, you find inspiration from the unlikeliest sources. And that certainly was one for me. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's uh, it's interesting kind of hearing you. Look, I have to look up Bluey and Bandit and Stripe. And, and it's, get it's so into it's it. so good. It really is. It's all it's, it's on Disney Plus. Check it out, people, especially Disney if you have Plus. if you're a parent <laughs> and especially if you have kids like it's one of those really well done kids cartoons. Wow. And, you know, I, I love that. And it, it's uh, it kind of just hearing you talk about that surfaced a lot for me. One of the things being um. Mike, I think in just in general that like, I don't know, I just want to see you give yourself like more credit because you're like I, I, it's something I kind of came to grips with. And I find that like and maybe this is just for my own mental health and sanity, but I need to be like militantly uh, defensive of the idea that I'm doing the best I can. I'm showing up the best I can, even in days that you know that i fucking suck whoa okay i need maybe i need to edit some of this out but like no but yeah like days where i suck where i'm like that was horrible or whatever you know i think yeah in, in i've and actually you know um thinking back to to my dad and and specifically like losing him when i was 24 when i when he passed mm. away i joined a grief group and um that was one of the best decisions i ever had because I, yeah. I realized in that moment like at that time with grief therapy one on one i tried like one session and it just wasn't for me and then being in the group was so powerful and one of the things i realized was that like literally everybody is doing the best that they can and yet we compare ourselves to all these other standards whether it's like a cartoon character and their parenting or actual people and social media and things that we're seeing and it's like we're doing the best that we can it's easy to compare ourselves it's easy to not give ourselves enough credit. And um, it goes back to what we were saying probably about an hour ago. Um, <laughs> but, you know, about just uh, it, it's good to have people who could also give that added per perspective. Um, yeah. And, you know, one thing I want to touch on, because I don't, we can't be here forever, Mike. This will be the longest episode of Pod Friends yet. Yeah, going from the shortest with Marianne to the longest. Hear with... that, Marianne? I broke your record. Yeah, that's right. Again. We're gonna go. We're gonna go another five hours. <laughs> there let's, we go. Let's rub it in for her. Uh, but you know, so you mentioned Angela in mm -hmm. the context of your. Well, you 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 mentioned her more in passing here. Mm -hmm. You talked a lot about Angela and just how she's your number one fan and supporter mm -hmm. and someone who in inspired you to start going to therapy just with her own going to therapy and navigating that and uh i don't know i just i kind of want to i don't know i want to give you space to like uh more properly talk about uh why angela's so great and amazing other than the fact that she has done things behind the scenes to support a poor little rhap podcasters like me which is definitely appreciated but why in your eyes mike is uh angela uh, amazing. Oh, I thought we didn't want to go on for five more hours because I could, I could certainly spend that time talking about how great my wife is. So I'll cut you, know, you off. Don't worry. I mean, everything that I was saying about, I think, my own trepidation and nervousness about parenting, I wouldn't say it's it's oppositional to her, but she is an incredibly natural mother, uh, both in terms of her instincts for her, like just absolute unabashed care and love for this child she is so selfless to put so many people above her sometimes to her own detriment again going sure. back to the mental health of it all that she inspires me every day and i, I look to her as like an, a source of parenting too with the way she responds to certain situations you know how to even just how to do certain mm -hmm. things uh we get into routines that's what certainly helps with with kids right is getting them into routines to help them do things like take a bath and brush their teeth and i think observing her and especially the way she goes about it i really appreciate i also appreciate like you know the the way she 
gives me feedback in a manner of speaking. I don't do this with me out there, people. But like sometimes the uh -oh. people closest to my life, like sometimes I need the share in Moonstruck, snap out of it, kind of <laughs> slap to the face of like hard love, especially again when I'm going through one of these more depressive episodes. And she has been someone that knows that and has been incredibly helpful in allowing me space and try, but also at the same time, feeling like, okay, I know what you need in this moment. And that to me, I think is the sign of an incredibly healthy relationship. I mean, our relationship has, has grown leaps and bounds, just I think with more responsibilities being afforded to us. Uh, you know, obviously we worked well together beforehand, but having a child requires you to work as a team. And yeah. you figure out they're like almost an entirely new dynamic where, okay, whether it's literal where so-and-so is going to handle this and so-and-so is going to handle this or more of like an emotional metaphorical perspective of, mm -hmm. okay, this one's going to approach things like this and this one's going to approach things like this. It has given me so much like introspection into not only our own relationship, but just how incredible of a person she is with the love that she gives the people that she truly cares about. Like she is somebody who mm. is absolutely exhausted at the end of the day. And, right. and I'm like, I wonder why sometimes not only because she's running around doing a million things, but like from an emotional investment perspective, she is someone that puts herself into like every minute of everything that she mm. does. And that can be exhausting, but can also be incredibly fulfilling. So, I mean, I've said it before, I would not be able to do any of this stuff without her backing, not only, you know, with her support from like a time perspective, from a workload perspective, but also just like the confidence as well. When I'm at yeah. my lowest moments, uh, you know, whether it was like me figuring out whether I was good at this stuff and turning to her, you know, knowing that there was always someone in my corner, that really helps. When we spoke before about Sometimes you feel like all you receive are negative comments. Like yeah. you can turn around to somebody and know that that person's always going to be stumping for you. And sometimes one voice in the crowd helping you is all that you need. And she was that one person and is that one person for me so much. And then also being able to say like, do these things, you know, live your life. I mean, if I'll be incredibly honest, one of the reasons why I was very, very nervous to become a parent. One of the many reasons because yeah. I was like, I I have a fear of change, Matt. Uh, uh -huh. I, I like routine. The unknown scares me sometimes. As odd as that is, Mr. Let's Commit to the Bit, Improv, Throw Anything at Me. It's from a life perspective. It's really tough for me to yeah. like pick up roots and try to move into something just because I usually have almost like a, a proactive grass is always greener thing of like, but I really like it right now. Why do I need to change it? Yeah. And so when I, I found out that Angela was pregnant, I, who I, I freaked out. I was so incredibly nervous because I thought this is it. My life is going to be completely changed. Nothing's yeah. ever going to be the same again. And that's not untrue, but Angela was really great at just reminding me of you know, not only the fact that there are 24 hours in a day and we can still take the time to do the things that we need. In fact, we should to sometimes take a break from those things that that sometimes can can weigh on us the most. But at the same time to, again, widen that scope and look to the people that you love. Look at someone like Rob, who is mm. a father of two and to watch his own journey. Right. Starting in 2010 to watch him become a father, you know, certainly he had to weigh out his priorities a little bit more, but it certainly did not stop him, nor has it at this point from making the content that he has yeah. in both quantity and quality. I think I had just sort of painted this picture in my head of like, okay, my life is over. I'm going to be, you know, devoted 24 hours a day to changing diapers and running, you know, after a toddler. And now I have to leave podcasting behind and, and writing behind and everything like that. Right. That is far from the case. You can keep things in balance. Again, you do need to shift things because you, mm -hmm. you need to make sure that, that everything is well covered and accounted for. But I always really appreciate her, I think, bringing me much needed perspective, whether it's when I'm in those low moments or just talking about 
the real world. Uh, I'm a, I would say I'm a, I'm a book smart person much mm-hmm. more than a street smart person. I grew up in suburban Connecticut, you know, where we wore boat shoes and two layers of polos to school every day. Mm-hmm. To say I was privileged would be an understatement. Yeah. And I still am. Uh, and I'm trying to learn from people. That's another opportunity. Why? I, another reason why I love the opportunity to talk with these reality TV contestants is that especially as of late, with more marginalized voices being brought to the table, yeah, I want to be able to use my ability as someone who you know is a cisgender heterosexual white male to be able to say like, listen, I I can't speak on behalf of you, so speak to me, tell me, and I've learned so much from all the different voices, yourself included, that I had the ability to speak to over the years, and I I as a result though I think lived a bit of a sheltered existence, uh, and so. Being able to learn so much from my wife who hasn't like she grew up on a farm, uh, you know, for and was working since she was like six or seven years old. Wow. Learning so much about from her about things from doing chores the right way to like learning things about the world and how certain things are done. It just has has made me view the world in a much fuller perspective. And I think also has certainly contributed to my own sense of seeing the forest for the trees and not fixating on this one specific thing that only applies to me, that remembering there is a larger sense of things that very much outweighs how I might be feeling in the micro. Wow. And that is, uh, not to be corny here, but that is like really what, the full bloom it looks like it feels like and just pulling out the true full bloom like we think the the wildness ridiculous and no 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 that's not my going full bloom it is it's that it's it's seeing yourself more fully and i i'm glad and thankful for this conversation and talking about so much and it's amazing to you thinking about the taryn show interview i can't recommend it enough not only because taryn's awesome mm-hmm. but because you talk about a bunch of things and share a lot of fun stories uh you you um talk about kissing bullies there. There's a oh, there's yeah. a lot. There's a lot. That, that was a yeah, an interesting tactic in retrospect. I do not recommend it for many reasons. I would recommend though that people go back and listen to it to um <laughs> as like a part. Well, you know what? If you listen to if you're listening to my voice now and you haven't listened to that, then listen to that as a part two of going there we further go. back. It's into like uh history. when the sequel is actually a prequel. Yeah, the, exactly. And you know maybe there's I don't know maybe you have like. Uh, some college podcast re- or college radio recordings that people could listen to after that. So just oh, go yeah. further I, I have further no back. idea if the uh, annals of WMUH is open from like 2009 to 2010 uh, when we would play yeah. <laughs> uh, Pterodactyl Planet, where we just picked random CDs out of uh, the repository. And we, but we did end every single show by taking out a vinyl record of the Cantina oh, song from Star Wars yeah. A New Hope. And we played it every, every week <sighs> to close out the show. <laughs> Look, this is uh, this is ridiculous. This is wild. Um, and you know, I have to ask as we kind of get to the point of wrapping up there, because again, we can't go on forever, Mike. Like, I have to ask, like, number one, a question I ask everybody on these podcasts about mm. your life. You know, and the question is, Mike, easy questions, a softball compared to everything else we've talked about. If your life were a book or documentary. What would the title be and why? And normally there's like this, this moment where people breathe in and they're like, I don't know. This is overwhelming, Matt. Why did you throw this at me? But Mike, I feel like you have you have a title just like right there on the tip of your tongue, ready to go, about to share it. Mike, the spotlight's on you. Uh, an open door and an open mind. I think is where I would go with both in the doors that, as we mentioned before, have been open to me career wise uh, to be able to do again, just the (laughs) truly surreal things that I've been able to do. But I think also at the same time, being able to approach those opportunities with an open mind, as we mentioned before, to field any ball that gets hit my way uh, to, you know, be asked to do things and usually say yes, most of the time, even if I'm not fully prepared for the experience, but then also, Corollary to my mental health journey, having more of an open mind, not being as closed off to not only my thoughts about the world, about those closest to me, but also about myself. I mean, in full bloom is also pretty good as well, but I'm still growing. I'm still growing. 
Yes. Matt. I'm not I'm not in full bloom yet. I'm always oh. growing. I always aim to learn something new every day. Uh, and, and those things can be small as well. Like sometimes I equate learning to, OK, I learned that uh, if I try to do this, then this will happen, like making it more personal instead of, OK, I must read scholastic journals every day. Even though, again, I am much more book smart than a street smart. That's still another thing I've realized as well is like, as much as I love mm -hmm. what I get to do, I don't want to make it all of who I am. And I think that's something that I've realized too, that right. I have been able to explore a lot of things that I've like always wanted to get into, but I haven't or I haven't wanted to like, Dungeons and Dragons is an example. Mm -hmm. That's something I never played until 2018 was something that I was kind of always approaching from a distance. And I was able to finally reach out to people, get involved. And I love it. It's it's one of my favorite things. Cause again, it's like improv mm. mixed with, you know, fun RPG elements. Um, I am somebody who was a, a fan of the NFL back in like my teenage days. Mm -hmm. And I really had fallen out of it due to my schedule, but I'm like, you know what? Let me get into it. And like, I'm, very much into it now wow. uh yeah. and so i really am a nerd about the world in a mm -hmm. manner of speaking i'm interested in a lot of stuff and i think i've been able to afford myself the space to be like i love covering these shows i love giving the mental headspace to, to tv to film because like those are the things i love most than anything in the world except for my family but at the same time, like, let's not make that your entire identity, because that's mm -hmm. when you go down really bad rabbit holes. Like, OK, if a podcast doesn't work, how does that reflect badly upon yourself? Like you right. are mo you are creatives out there. You are more than the things you put out there for mm -hmm. good and for bad. They can be reflections of you, but they are not you. You look in the mirror. That is a reflection of you, but it is not an entirely different version of yourself. So I, I would recommend people, again, to find those dissociations, to find those things that you're interested in. Because, I mean, I went, I went to a liberal arts college for a reason. I've always been, like, at least a little bit interested in everything. Uh, yeah. You talk about, like, the Bob Newhart references. <laughs> my my thoughts about the world is, is, like, a mile wide and an inch deep. I like to know a uh -huh. little bit about everything out there i love reading like scientific books and i love reading random history novels as well uh just because i i love so much about everything this odd odd planet has to offer uh, and so it definitely would be sort of an open door and an open mind from many different perspectives mm, I, I love that and i love what you said of the message really to creators and the things that you've created um is so meaningful because rather than uh, I think you put it perfectly in terms of the things that you create not being you. But I think the other piece of it is that the things that you create, like you said, they are a reflection of you uh, to an extent. And they also could be an entryway to people getting to know you better um, and more and un starting to understand the complex puzzle that is you. But Mike, we've talked about like the last five years for the most part and about your life overall pretty much the last thing I want to ask you for, t for today, for today, for today. Okay. the last thing I want to ask you, you, can, is you like, can ask me more questions for the rest of your life. We're I, not gonna will, I will, I will, I will, I will. There will be tons of questions. So many more than this, tons of hours of questions. Oh, yeah, exactly. Like if you look ahead to five years from now, so that would be 20, just starting 2020. 2027. You know, the good old times. Uh, but looking ahead, like what is the, I guess I'm curious. Um, and I, I, I was talking about this with Marianne a little bit. Like um, I get that there's not, I don't have a clear vision of where I want to be in five years, but I do wonder like, what would you like five years from now to be like for you? Um, like, what are some of the elements of that? Um, what do you want that to look like? Do you have any goals that are tied to that? Marianne wants to go to Australia, get married and something else that I can't remember. Off okay. The top well, of I've done two right. out of those three things. I've gotten married <laughs> and something else. <laughs> uh, I mean, listen, I wish I knew the answer. Uh, it's yeah. so interesting because I've also figured out, that from a planning perspective, 
I'm a very short term planner. Now, sometimes it's out of necessity because again, I'm doing so much, but I think for me, when I'm approached like, oh yeah, we're going to go on this vacation, like six months from now, I'm like, yeah, that's great. Like remind me in like three months, essentially, just because yeah. I, I don't like, nor do I necessarily think in from such a, a long-term perspective. Mm -hmm. I think it's also probably helped and hurt by the idea that five years ago, I would not imagine I was where I am now. I mean, both from a career perspective, what I've been able to do, even from like a family perspective, uh, you know, uh, one of the reasons, other reasons why I was trepidatious about finding out that Angela was pregnant was because I didn't know if I wanted to be a father. Uh, before right. I really got into a relationship with Angela, I was someone that was set on just like, being a you know happy bachelor the rest of my life uh, mm -hmm. only to realize i could be a happier married man uh, mm -hmm. to have someone i could walk through life with and so mm -hmm. it's tough to like see what exactly will happen to me and what i want to do because for me oftentimes i don't realize how much i wanted something until i have it that happened with asher right. i didn't realize how much i wanted to be a dad until i had him with these interviews, I didn't realize how much I wanted to do this until I started doing it. And so I think I'm going to continue to keep jumping headfirst into opportunities. And whether I land or whether I slip, enjoy them. I think I want to keep having the ability to talk with so many incredible people and hopefully parlay that into being able to have so many other great voices out there, be able to tell their story I want to be able to both, you know, shirk away the lower points in my life and not mire, while also acknowledging that I can do that and to not mm -hmm. beat myself up about it. You know, I, like I said, I'm in a very happy, content place in my life right now. And I think I would just want to keep on keeping on from that perspective five years from now. The frame of the painting may look a little more different may have even more white hairs in on it but no. i think the the uh the makeup of the painting within the frame would still largely be the same i hope just because i've done a lot of work at this point to get to where i am from an, a personal perspective a family perspective a career perspective in a perfect world it would keep going Mm. And you know, I will say I'm ready for Silver Fox Mike Bloom oh! with the, ooh, like that because I honestly do think if you just uh, did a little of the Anderson Cooper thing, that's a whole other career for you. That's oh, a whole wow. other life. That'd be a listen. Call me. Netflix, I'll, I'll host the mole. That's probably as far as like I'm not, I'm not. I'm not. I won't go on to CNN again. I'm not a hard hitting journalist. No, I'll, I'll host the mole. Not yet. You you know, you could, maybe CNN will evolve and they'll need you. I would rather have you on CNN than anyone else who's on there. Wow. Okay. And you know what? I Maybe that's me in five years. I hope they're offended. Maybe that's I'll be I'll be hosting years. the New Year's Eve party. <laughs> I mean, sloshed. that would be great. I'll be there. I'll be there, please. Like as long when you're hosting the New Year's Eve party, invite me and it'll be a great time. Oh yeah, you'll, you'll get can... the first invite, don't you worry. Yeah, awesome. And I, I have to say too, like as we wrap up, you know, as that vision of the five years becomes more clear, I hope that you share that. I don't know if it's like publicly or with who, but like I want to support you on hmm. where you want to be in that five years. Sincerely. I'm sure so many others want to be part of that. And I think like the biggest thing I could say, maybe speak as we start to wrap up, like speaking for the people who are listening is that, you know, and we talked about this, but like, just to, to say this to you, you don't know how much of an impact you have for people, how much of an impact you've had on people. Um, and I, I feel like after this episode, there'll be a lot of people reaching out with a lot of that feedback and just that love and um, what you've meant to them. But I just want to thank you for showing up um, for so many people in so many ways. And um, also thank you, hopefully, for continually showing up for yourself too but yeah. i've so i love you mike i have oh, so I love much you, love Matt. for you i'm, oh my I'm God. so happy we had the pleasure yeah. of meeting in person uh, this year twice not not yeah. only because yeah. as we mentioned before like these events i think renew honestly our sense of purpose in this type yeah. of stuff but just like getting to see the warmth that you bring i mean again like as a fellow interview your 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 interview skills were so potent since 
a little bit of a peek behind the curtain here uh, when it came to the class of 2020 for people such as Matt, you know, we had you all come in and do like essentially like Zoom group interviews <laughs> yeah. with us. And I and I remember you, Matt. I remember watching your video and I was so incredibly impressed by your interviewing skills. And I I am with being both a subject and from an objective perspective as mm. well. You just, you do have that ability to, I think, bring people in to actively listen to follow up, but I think to also take the conversation in really natural yet interesting direction. So I think you talking about five years from now should keep doing what you're doing because I think it is absolutely sterling. And thank you so much for the kind words. And for anyone, again, I will say that has brought me kind words in the past. You know, I know doing things like a three and a half hour brand steal sometimes, you know, it's, it's the stuff that Rob and I can sometimes leave being like, that was so stupid. We had so much fun. And to hear people sometimes be like, oh, yeah, we absolutely love that. You know, that was something that I needed when I was going yeah. through a lot of stuff right now. That means the world to me. Because when I had sort of like given up being an actor, I think I sort of like thought that part of my life was done. And I am so happy that that has parlayed its way into podcasting. Not to say that like I specifically do it for that type of stuff but it's a really nice thing to have. And considering that I was, you know, a listener, a fan of a, a podcast before I actually became a podcaster proper, I know how much sometimes getting away and listening to like a stupid idiot do a goofy thing on a podcast can sometimes make your day. It feels incredibly lovely. And I feel honored to have ever at any point in time with people been that for somebody so thank you all you do not know how much you all mean to me i would not be around without mm. you all out there and i also I'll, let me also give shout outs here because i think mm, and I like we it. said like find find your community find your network in a manner of speaking and i'm gonna give two specific shout outs uh because these people i've gotten so close with in the past five years and like they are my rocks. Uh, Shannon Gus, of course. I it's, love her. I, I, love would be like putting it mildly. I mean, it's it's a wild story, but like the the odd thing about this world being so global and so virtual is that I can have this like random girl from Australia by way of South Africa become my best friend. <laughs> right. She's someone. She's someone I talk to every day. Uh, not only do we talk Survivor, but like we have been so therapeutic to each other, uh, whether it's dealing with perhaps some of those issues of feedback that you're mentioning before yeah. or imposter syndrome or feeling like you're not good enough. But then also, I think just talking with each other about life, I never, ever would have expected that she would become one of the most important people in my life. And I am so incredibly honored that I get to be within even like the smallest orbit of just the planet that she is. And the other person that I want to shout out, which I did before is of course, Josh Wiggler, who has gotten me to so many places. First, I mean, from a career perspective with the doors he was able to open, he was able to get me out onto set for survivor 39. And, you know, I, 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 I hope I have taken the torch up admirably, you know, yeah. in his stead in his exit from survivor journalism, but he has really taught me everything. I know I admire him so much as a leader, as a person. One of the reasons why I was able to open up so much is, you know, when I started talking about my mental health, it was after Josh had talked about his own battles with addiction mm. through uh, some particular right. episodes of lost. And that was something that just felt so inspirational to me that it, it felt like it gave me permission to be myself as well. I uh, never had a brother growing up. I had a younger sister. Josh is the closest thing I'll ever have to a brother. And I am so grateful to him. He's a business partner. We know we can be honest with each other. We know we can shoot the shit with each other. But we also know that we can be like incredibly vulnerable with each other. I can't say that about, you know, everybody in this world. And so... I want to show those two out. Of course, I have to shout out Rob, who gave me a chance in the first place. I forgot if I told my origin story on the Terran show. Did I? 
You, uh, d- that's a good question. So you, oh, the is this the Mr. X story? Yeah, 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 about how I essentially, like, uh, came into, uh, out yeah. to Rob with a pseudonym and was like, let me work on your Wikipedia stuff. <laughs> it really is to the credit of Rob Sester, you know, just right. being this, like, very open person. And that's what I have so much respect for him. The fact that, you know, he's been doing this for 13 years and you think at a certain point, and he does sort of standardize things to a certain extent with the way he does content, but taking things like a lot of the reckonings that came in 2020, for instance, his maturity to be able to step back and be like, how can I use what I do and my platform to bring mm-hmm. in voices like you and the class yeah. of 2020 and approach things from a different perspective. That inspires me as well. And I give him so much credit in the world for also giving me a start for giving this like goofy ass boy an opportunity to get onto a microphone and just foam at the mouth and go blue and go bloom and make a bunch of stupid references and do characters and dress up and do odd dances and songs and do you know three hour simulations of survivor seasons featuring a Popeye's Love chicken it. sandwich <laughs> like I he taught me to actively engage in the nonsense mm-hmm. and I am so happy he was able to not only like get that ball that I bat to him, but then also mm-hmm. bat it right back. Some of the most fun I have podcasting is with him just because we have a great time together. And I think it speaks towards the network his he's been able to create uh, as a podcaster, as well as the friendship that we have in terms of being able to, you know, be able to, to get that relationship that we have over, over the past almost 10 years. It has been incredible so I'm, I'm sure i'm missing people a la an oscar's speech but i think of course those people have been so essential to me from a creative and a personal perspective into getting to the place where i am right now and so i i would not be where i am without them and i think wow. that's uh it's, it's you know i want to take the opportunity to to shout out because like you said matt we should shout out more of the people that we appreciate and the people that we love that we, we take too much for granted and i have so much to appreciate of those three Awesome. And I appreciate you sharing that appreciation. And I don't know what it was as you were sharing all of that, but it just popped to my, to my mind. Like, um, I mean, like we're all, you're, you're lucky to have them. We're all lucky to have them. Um, it, and it, the reverse goes for us being lucky to have you. But the thing that I was going to say, and, and I, I mean, this goes without saying, but there's only one Mike Bloom. There's only one Mike Bloom. Like, I can't, there's no one, I I haven't been in a space where I've been like, oh, that person reminds me of Mike or, you know, it's like you bring something that's so unique. And I think it was you pointing to like just the goofiness and the shenanigans of it all. But it's like, we freaking need that, Mike. Like this in the last three years of a Mm. global pandemic and not to mention all of the other issues in our world politically, health-wise, socially, we need that energy that you're bringing. And so I'm glad that Shannon and Josh and Rob and others help unlock that and pull that out and give you space to do that, which gives space to more people to do that, including all of the future guests of pod friends who probably are also fans of yours. And Mm. so um, Mike, this has been awesome. Oh yeah. It's been, it's been great. And yeah, I, I completely agree that. And I think I've talked about this, I believe on down the hatch that, Back when, you know, a lot of stuff was happening in 2020, I legitimately did have, like, a a big self-introspective moment of, like, should I be doing this? Like, there are so many important things going on in the world. Am I paving them over, you know, like, cementing away these the the, the cracks in the foundation by, like, doing these goofy things that feel like they don't even matter at this point? But... I think you bring up a very valid point that much like I, when I feel like the weight of the world is on my shoulders, like to dissociate by, you know, watching an episode of classic Simpsons or a let's play of a video game that I'm really into. I could serve as that source. We can serve as that source totally for people as well. Not to say that it's like, it's just as important as it's called. It's cause it certainly isn't, but I think it's, it, it serves its own vital reasons as well and again to be able to serve as that in any minuscule portion to not distract from what are some very important issues but i think to sometimes help unburden people from that 
means the world to me. Yeah. And I mean, eh, we could go on forever. It's, I would argue that it might be even more important because we don't recognize how important it is to bring that in. But um, yeah, just uh, appreciate you, Mike. We could go Same. on. And on. Same, I know. Man. I know. I'm like, the, the listeners don't want it to end, Mike. And I just want to give you a space for any closing words for this conversation. Just to, the floor is yours, Mike, to, to uh, say the final words for this con- this interview oh god should i do like survivor final words of like i had a great time i can't believe this happened uh yeah i mean i don't know i feel like i've been doing final words for the past like 20 <laughs> minutes of just like here are all these profound things Same. i figured out about <laughs> life i mean i guess what i would say though is that uh i i know nothing mm-hmm. matt scott uh yeah. i you oh. know and i and i think being able to embrace that has also helped that i'm ready to take whatever life throws my way and having the the you know composition to know that it is something I can handle to know like you're able to take care of this child you've been able to do however many podcasts a week you've been able to handle some interviews around some incredibly tough subjects in what I think was a fair manner you can take on the world and again as someone who wanted to be taken away from the world quite a number of years ago even days ago yeah. Uh, it, it's it's a good reminder, and so I'm I'm excited to just keep doing what I'm doing. You know, we're recording this in the beginning of January. A new year is always exciting for me, not just because it's a debut of you know a new slate of shows, but it just yeah. gives me more more opportunities. It's um the my my header on my Facebook page is uh, a frame from the final issue of Calvin and Hobbes. Did you read Calvin and Hobbes? Were you a funny guy, Matt? No, 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 no. And now I'm going to read your Facebook uh, and the header in your Facebook. <laughs> yeah, so basically what it is is Calvin and Hobbes is a book that I have always loved. I remember uh, what I would do is like, my parents one Christmas got me like the complete works of Calvin and Hobbes, which is like through yeah. giant books of this comic by Bill Waterston. And I would just like bring them to restaurants and just mm-hmm. read the books back in, in the days where there weren't smartphones. Um, but I'm trying to look it up here. So it's the last strip where it's Calvin and Hobbes. It's the middle of winter. Yes. And uh, they say, wow, it really snowed last night. Isn't it wonderful? And Hobbes, which is the stuffed tiger, says, oh, everything familiar has disappeared. The world looks brand new. A new year, a fresh, clean start. It's like having a big white sheet of paper to draw on. A day full of possibilities. It's a magical world, Hobbes, old buddy. Let's go exploring. And the the it ends with uh-huh. them sort of taking off on this sled into this white snow into the beyond. And that's how I feel about not only the year. The year, I guess, is a calendarial excuse to do it, mm-hmm. but just like looking at my life is this big canvas that I continually get to draw on and paint on. And I'm excited to, you know, I'm back from the art store, got more supplies, let's keep painting. Oh, wow. Wow. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening to this episode and going on this journey with me for Pod Friends. And I just want to give a shout out to everyone who's hearing my voice now as we wrap up the episode. And just thank you for being on the journey. And just to cut to the chase, there are really three things that um, I want to ask folks to do just as we wrap up. And the first thing, one, is to kind of take time um, to take care of yourself and just to breathe, to let this sit, to process. Um, I know that I'm taking time to do that also. It's very important to do that, um, especially before going on to the next podcast. There's a lot that we talked about here, and I know that this lands um, differently for a lot of folks. Um, But take that time for yourself. And if you want to leave a voicemail with how you're feeling, feel free to leave a voicemail at speakpipe.com slash podfriendsfeed. It may be included in a future episode. Um, I also might just listen to it and, um, you know, get back to you and appreciate you for sending that. Um, The second thing I want to ask, though, is to the point of this conversation that you reach out to Mike and that you show a podcaster some love, whether it's Mike for this episode, whether it's anyone who you know who you appreciate in this podcasting community i you know i don't think it's it's much to say that we really don't hear that enough and 
you know, I realize that so many of us are appreciated more than we realize. So reach out. And finally, um, I just would love if you could subscribe to Pod Friends for more conversations like this. I really don't know what to expect for the rest of this Pod Friends season over the next several weeks or um, more Pod Friends to come, but would love to have you on the journey on the Pod Friends feed. Rob has a website.com slash Pod Friends feed. And so, again, I'm Matt Scott, your host. You could find me at Matt Scott GW. You could find Pod Friends at Hey Pod Friends. And you could find me with my co host, Mari Fourth, at Mari Talks Too Much. That's two, like number two, hosting the Pro Wrestling Podcast, the Wrestling Rehab Up. And that's all I've got for you today. But again, thanks for being on this journey. I love Mike. <laughs> I've said that so many times. I said that to him so many times. Um, and I love all of you for really being here on the journey. It means more than you ever know. Um, thanks as always. And uh, thank you for being a pod friend.